I'm Alice Loxton, and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things royal history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. You've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount for History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details in the video description and use the code REALROYALTY, all one word, when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Royal food served on the grandest tables is so much more than just a meal. Historically, these extravagant dishes were created to represent power. They also set fashions. Nowadays, royal food is all about showcasing the best of British. In celebration of royal food... We know it's the Queen's recipe because we've got it in our own hand. ..from the present and the past. That is proper regal. We recreate old family favourites. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. What yep. a mess. We sample royal eating al fresco. Oh, wow. That <laughs> yeah. is what you want. And revisit the most extravagant times. Pheasant, stag, turkey, salmon, oysters and turbot dressed in a lobster champagne sauce. Unbelievable. This is Royal Recipes. Hello, I'm Michael Burke and welcome to Royal Recipes. This is Audley End, one of Britain's finest stately homes, built in the style of a royal palace and once owned by a king. In the splendour of the gardens, halls and kitchen of this grandest of country houses, we'll be recreating the food served at the highest royal tables. And it all starts here with this gem a royal kitchen maid's cookbook, the only surviving recipe book of its kind in the Royal Archive. This is an exact copy of the original, which is kept at Windsor Castle. Inside, the recipes of Mildred Nichols, who worked at Buckingham Palace in the early 1900s. And for the first time in over a 100 years, we'll be bringing these recipes back to life. This time, we're cooking food served for afternoon tea, a favourite in the royal family for generations. A great British mid-afternoon feast of sandwiches and cakes. Today, in the Royal Recipes kitchen, Michelin star chef Paul Ainsworth puts the Queen's favourite twist on a classic bake. The Queen, I think, likes a particular kind of scone, doesn't she? She does. Go for it. Mm. Historian Dr Annie Gray discovers how Queen Alexandra treated thousands of poor maids in London to a tea party. It was like society was turned topsy-turvy because ladies waited on them. And Mitch Turner recreates a miniature masterpiece she made for the Queen. And that is my afternoon tea crown cake on a perfect cool Britannia. Here in this beautiful stately home, we start with a quintessential afternoon tea treat, a firm favourite of the royals. And we're here in the wonderful old kitchen. It's all coppers and ranges and, and history. And Michelin-starred chefs like Paul here. How are you, Michael? How are you doing, Paul? Very now, good. What do you do? It's afternoon tea today, isn't it's it? It's afternoon now, tea. Widely reported, this is the Queen's favourite meal. So what are you going to do? I'm going to do Battenberg cake. Oh, yes, yeah, I used to have that when I was a kid. It's, it's That's the one with the squares. Isn't That's it, it the yeah. ones with the squares built up. Okay. So, what we've got here is two sponge mixtures, mm -hmm. okay? This one's vanilla, mm -hmm. and this one has no vanilla in it because this is going to become chocolate. So, we're going to go straight in with our vanilla sponge. Mm -hmm. And the important thing with this is making sure that we spread it right to the edge of our baking tray, mm -hmm. but also as well that we've got no air trapped in there. And I'll show you a way of how we can kind of get rid of that. And what happens if you do get air trapped in there? Well, you just, you know, when you get like, you know, when you see a sponge that's got pockets in it, like just, oh, yeah, yeah. just sort of uh, air pockets. So that's what that is. So if we just kind of get rid of our bowl yep. for that one, we're just going to spread that mix right to the edges. Oh, it's like wonderfully so. gooey, isn't it? It's lovely. I kind of like that stuff it's before a, you cook it. I know, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what? It's, it's lovely. It's, it's, it's a kid lovely in me. raw. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the kid in me. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've got our vanilla mixture in there. You know, I told you earlier about that scientific way of getting yeah, rid of the air. Very technical, you said. Very technical, I said, didn't I? Yeah. Like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very technical. <laughs> Talking about technical, presumably it's important to get the two bits of cake 
looking the same. Absolutely, Michael. And a nice little tip is rather than looking at your eggs by number, look at them by weight. So weigh the eggs. Yeah, they can vary so much. Of course they, they can vary. You can yeah. have small eggs, large eggs. So weigh the eggs. Yeah. And if you wait, then you'll get your two sponges exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. It'll look as if it's been cooked by a professional. Cook. It will. It will yeah, <laughs> Instead it of by will. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it's you right, too, Michael. Right. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Do you know why they're called Battenberg cakes? No. No, me. neither do I, actually. But one theory, <laughs> <laughs> one theory, one theory is there was a Prince Louis of Battenberg who, who married uh, Queen Victoria's granddaughter, also right. called okay. Victoria. And that this cake was... Uh, was created uh, for the wedding. Right. Actually, the Battenbergs, in the First World War, when people didn't like German names, had to change their name. It means Mount Batten in German. Berg means mountain. And Prince Philip is a Mount Batten through uh, his uncle. OK. Gosh, that, that looks good. Go on. Go on. No, no, I'm not going to. Go no, on. No, 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 no. <laughs> right, so what it I've got too here... tempting. It's the same sponge mixer, yeah. no vanilla, and we've got chocolate. So we've done cocoa powder, just yeah. mixed in with milk yeah. to make that lovely paste, and we folded it into here to yeah. our cake mixture. Now we're going to do exactly the same. This one being just ever so slightly it's smoother. It's smoother, isn't it? It's, it's kind yeah. of really gooey, lovely. isn't it? And it's important, Michael, to make sure it's completely folded in. You can't do this with kids around, can you? No, you can't. Their fingers no, you are being it. Because they're going to be like all over that. Yeah. All so the corgis. Just... You've got to keep the corgis. In yeah, all the fun. corgis. So we just move, and same again, right to the yeah. corners. Quite a bit easier to work with, the, this is the chocolate one. Yeah, yeah. Right to the corners like that. Same procedure, little tap. <laughs> <laughs> and if I could give those to you, you to can. go put in the oven. I'll be very careful. Absolutely. Well About 30 minutes at 160, please. Done. Thank you. How are they looking, Michael? Oh, oh fantastic. Terrific. Well, so they'll far. take... They'll take about 30 minutes, yeah. 160, gas mark sort of four or five, yeah, um, yeah. and they'll rise beautifully. Mm. Great way to check them is just put a nice like, pastry needle in the middle, yeah. take it back out, and if it's clean, the mix is beautifully cooked. Top tip. OK. Now we've got some marzipan. Love marzipan. Yeah. I, every kid loves marzipan, don't they? Fantastic stuff. We've just rolled that out in icing sugar, actually. Oh, it's so not flour? Got, no, it's not flour. Mm. So we don't want that horrible taste of, like, raw mm. flour. So we've got that lovely icing sugar. So what I've got here I, is our vanilla sponge and our chocolate sponge that's been cooked. Now, just for it, so it's nice and neat, I'm just going to whip off those ends like that for you to have a little sneaky taste. Oh, can I? Yep, yep, yep. I can just feel by running my knife for it just how moist and beautiful it is. Mm. These are the ones I made earlier. Oh, great. So we're just cutting our sponges into these lovely strips. So just straight down like that. The ones I remember were pink. Yeah, they were. And the ones I had were pink as well. <laughs> so they may be a bit more natural, yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. I should think this is the one the Queen probably has because she's particularly fond of chocolate, isn't she? Yes. Mm, that's nice, too. Uh, another nice little tip you could do as well, if there was no kids having it, you could just soak these sponges or just brush them with some alcohol of your choice. Yeah. So now I'm laying them out. Yeah. And you see how they start to come together? And at this point, you want to be quite neat, but remember, you're going to fold up, you're going to cut yeah. those edges off. Yeah. So... You're lucky they're not breaking. Our first Isn't that base, a bit of a danger when you pick them up like that? Just be very careful. Just hold yeah. them, yet, yeah, just like that. Just hold them in and the I middle. see what you mean about them having to be the same height. It'll look Absolutely. a bit... Absolutely. It'll look to be untidy otherwise. Now, over here, I've got some apricot jam on the stove. Oh. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? These royal recipes are fantastic. I know. I've got my elastic belt on. <laughs> right, now I'm just going to brush that over like so. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to carry the same procedure all the way to the top. And we want to put a little bit on the marzipan as well. Yeah. OK, and a bit that side. Right. Next, we're going to swap it over. We're going to go vanilla first this time. OK. Here we go, like that. More of that lovely, delicious apricot jam. And this is to jam. make it stick together. That's it, that's your binder. Mm. OK. Up the sides, like that. Next one. And then we go back and we repeat the process the same as the bottom. You're an artist, really, aren't you? Well... It, Yes, I'd like to think so, Michael, yes. <laughs> yeah. OK, now balance them up like that. More of that lovely, delicious apricot jam. I mean, look at this. It's just yeah. lovely, isn't it? It's great fun to make as well. Great fun. Right, we've got that all up there. Now we're going to roll, OK? Yep. So we're just going to pick that up like that, keep it nice and tight. Yeah. All right? Yep. Now get your hands over under like that, OK? Oh, that, keep yeah. it nice and tight. Yeah. All right? 
Don't worry about this stage. It may look a bit messy, but it's about keeping it tight. Yeah. OK? And looking at it from this end... Wipe your hands. Looking at it from this end, as you do it... Yeah. Uh, it, it just shows you how... I mean, a lot of people say it's nothing to do with German royal families or anything like that. It's an old English recipe that used to be called church window cake right. because of those squares. Oh, OK, yeah, so, I see. Yeah. I see. Pays your money, takes your yeah, choice. absolutely. Isn't it? Now, you see I've brushed a bit more jam. Yep. Now I'm going to go right over and oh. I'm just going to push that down like that yep. and that's our seal, OK? Yep. Cover our ends like that and we Always do that to not let any air in. Yep. Now, what you do is transfer that onto some greaseproof paper, mm -hmm. then onto cling film, roll it up to keep it nice and tight, yeah. and just let it set in the fridge for an hour. That makes it solid? Solid, nice yeah. and tight. Yeah. 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 So then... Are you ready? I am. There we go. Oh, it's perfect, Look isn't it? That. Absolutely perfect. Geometric. That's just yeah. by rolling it in the parchment paper, then yeah. the cling film, and just letting it set, yeah. then the whole thing just tightens and becomes yeah. like that. We, I'm going to cut you a slice. I'm going to pour like you to a pour cup of tea. tea. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. Fantastic. You take it with milk? I do. <laughs> no sugar. No sugar. No sugar. <laughs> of course, you wouldn't have anything fattening, would you? No, not at all. <laughs> no, not, not at all. No butter or anything like that, or cream, or, or cake. There we awesome. are. There we go. Fork? Fork. For you? Yep. Is yep. that lovely apricot jam running through? Yeah, well? look at it. I'm trying to do this with my little finger raised. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll join you. <laughs> Listen, there we go. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm. Oh, man. <laughs> that is absolutely delicious. Takes me back to my childhood, but the ones I had in my childhood were nothing like as good as this. But you know what? That flavour of childhood is the marzipan. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it? Just yeah. straight away. You're right. A delicious chocolate version of this classic cake. Perfect for a modern royal afternoon tea. Do you know the, the British habit of taking tea in the afternoon, afternoon tea, yeah. uh, started in the 17th century and had a lot to do with Audley End here. Right, OK. Because this was owned by Charles II. Yeah. And tea drinking was actually brought to this country, at least in part, by his wife, Catherine of Braganza. She was Portuguese. Yeah. She came here from Portugal, had a really rough journey, got off the boat and said... I want a cup of tea, and all they had was beer, ale. Right, OK. And that's <laughs> she where, soon and changed that. Came yeah, from. she wow. soon changed that. And I yeah. suppose the natural step then was cake. Yeah, because they yeah. used to have sugar in the tea. Yeah. Everybody had sugar in the tea then. And then later, Queen Alexandra, she loved afternoon tea, but she thought the poor should have it as well. Right. And she reckoned that was the ideal thing for the poor maids of London. Fantastic. <laughs> As afternoon tea was very much an aristocratic affair at the time, the then Princess Alexandra decided to play her part in trying to change this by arranging a special tea party for some unsuspecting guests. Historian Annie Gray is finding out more about this pioneering royal. Princess Alexandra was the beautiful and extremely fashionable wife of Edward, Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's eldest son. However, married to a prince though she may have been, her husband was known as Edward the Caresser. So I think it's fair to say she hadn't exactly drawn a long straw when it came to her marriage. Alexandra turned a blind eye to her husband's many mistresses and threw herself into charitable works, quickly becoming one of the most popular royals of the time. Her other great passion in life was afternoon tea, as described in a book written by a member of the royal household at the time. The teas, the author said, were held in a charming sitting room. Places were set all around the long table, and there is a seemingly inexhaustible supply of cakes, both hot and cold, sandwiches of all kinds, rolls and jams. But when the weather was fine and the king and his guests were in the grounds, the queen extended the hospitality of her beautiful tea room. In 1902, in order to celebrate her husband's coronation, Alexandra hit upon the bright idea of combining these two important elements in her life, tea-taking and charitable work. She sponsored a whole series of teas for 10,000 maids of all work. A thousand of them came here to Fulham Palace to have their tea in the Bishop of London's garden. <laughs> At this time, domestic service was the biggest source of employment for women. 
Our own Mildred Nichols was to go into service herself six years later at Buckingham Palace. These skivvies and grafters at the bottom of the food chain were about to be given a taste of the high life. Hello, I'm Miranda. Hello. Welcome to Fulham Palace. I'm Ali. This is, this is fab. Yeah, it is rather special, isn't it? Yeah. Miranda Polyakov is curator at Fulham Palace, home to the Bishop of London, where one of the charitable teas was held. So here we have my goodies that I've got out for you to see. So this invitation is very special to us. It was for a Miss Ada Smith to tea at four o'clock on Tuesday, July the 29th to celebrate the coronation in 1902. All the 10,000 maids who attended these teas were each given a brooch. Ada was obviously a very careful lady and she left her brooch on her invitation. It's such a remarkable thing to have. And so what would the maids have been eating? Well, we haven't got an exact description of what was served here, but this cutting we have from the Daily Graphic says that the tea was a substantial one and much appreciated. And this chap here seems to be serving, well, I imagine it's probably just bread and butter, isn't it? But maybe they got white bread. After all, that was supposed to be much better for you. I'm sure they would have had cake as well. Yeah. Sadly, the soon-to-be-crowned queen was unable to attend on the day as the king was taken ill. So the job of hosting a thousand maids was left to the newly appointed bishop. He was very disappointed that the Queen actually didn't come on the day, but um, he had his ladies. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had a military band and he had a choir from the Chapel Royal. So it really was all yes, singing, all yes, dancing, yes. quite literally, for all these, these sort yes. of belaboured maids. He wrote in his memoirs that everything went well, except that the thousand maids insisted in all kissing the band, but the band didn't seem to mind, <laughs> so that was fine. And he actually also, in addition to the normal tea they were given, he also provided grapes from the hothouse here. These very special tea parties were a chance for some of the lowest paid workers in society to have a rare day off and to toast the new king and queen. It must be very special, I mean, it's even his own butler by the look yeah. of it, standing here um, with teapots and tea urns. It must have been amazing if you were a maid of all work, used to being the lowest of the low, to be invited here and sit on the lawn and be served by a butler. Yes, and also ladies, it was like society was turned topsy-turvy because ladies waited on them. Here they were, uh, it's a very special place that they would never think they'd be invited and being waited on by, by people who would normally be their employers. It's a lovely idea, though. I mean, when you think to have it under royal sponsorship as well, to actually go out there and show that you're thinking of some of the poorest and, I suppose, most looked down upon members of society, just 10,000 girls having a really special day, that's just something really quite nice. Two of the classics in the afternoon tea world, and indeed favourites in the royal household, are scones and chocolate eclairs. Now, for a really grand royal afternoon tea, there are certain essential ingredients, aren't, aren't there, Paul? Yes. Uh, scones. Scones? Scones. Yes. Scones. Uh, and the Queen, I think, likes a particular kind of scone, doesn't she? She does. Orange, and it's absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. It really works. A bit different as well. So in these, it's your typical scone recipe, and we've got orange blossom water in there and orange zest. So it's quite fragrant, really delicious. Come on, then, so, would you like to try it? Yeah, come on. Yeah. And what's also nice, to carry on that theme with the orange, is the marmalade. Mm -hmm. So, Now, do you go... put the marmalade on first or the cream on first? Of course, from, from, from Cornwall. Oh, I see. Is that different? Absolutely, from yeah, very different. They do it the other way oh, around, do they? Yeah. In their benighted way. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So we're going to go on with our lovely jam first, yeah. OK? Yeah. And then just a beautiful... Oh, just a small amount. Just a small amount, Michael. Like that. Oh, this is going to be hell, there isn't it? There you are. Look at I mean... Can I? Look at that. OK. Go for it. Mmm. Oh. Mm. Got a bad hand. <laughs> oh, lovely and orange. Nice, it? aren't they? Oh, Delicious. I can see what the Queen means in that. OK. And the other thing you need to do... Yes. Eclairs. Eclairs, absolutely. That's what you're going to do now, isn't it? Yes. So, very simple eclairs. They are choux pastry, yeah. OK? And we are going to fill them with a lovely, what the French call creme chantilly. So basically a vanilla cream with fresh vanilla and icing sugar. So just get your nozzle right in the end and yeah. just literally keep filling it with cream until it's, like, just bursting out the ends. 
and you can feel it going all the way through <laughs> right to the bottom. <laughs> really you want squeezy. them filled with all the way up, filled with cream. Absolutely, it's, it's extraordinary how many of these uh, of these dishes that are so familiar were actually come from the royal family or the royal family's chefs. Uh, one of the royal family's early chefs, a man called Karem, Karem. in the 1800s, yes. famous, wasn't he? It's all famous among your mob. Yes, French yeah. mob. <laughs> <my mom. laughs> yeah. Anyway, Monsieur Karem yeah. is supposed to be the man who invented the eclair. Well, did you know that? I didn't know he invented the eclair, but whoever invented it is um, it's a true triumph because it's absolutely delicious. Yeah. Right, so we've just filled these right up with cream, just yeah. getting it all in, so it's literally spurting out the edges. Yeah. Okay. Now next, which I'm going to get you to help me with, is the fun bit. So here we have chocolate glaçage, <laughs> shiny yeah. dark chocolate sauce. <laughs> okay, so you're in there, you've got um, golden syrup yeah. with cocoa powder, uh, dark chocolate, a little bit of glucose syrup, water, and you just bring those, and some butter, mm. and you just bring those ingredients to a simmer and then just whisk it and it goes, so you've got the glucose syrup, the butter, uh, the golden syrup, that, that's what gives it that lovely shine. And that's the point, isn't it? Because eclair means lightning in French. It's got a shine. It's got yeah, a sparkle. Yeah, abs yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just dipping it into that, dipping it into that sauce, like so. Oh, that's very clever. So you don't pour and it. Just, you don't pour it over no, the you top. Don't pour it over as the top. I would. And then just literally like that, one by one. You're being very so precious just, about it, aren't you? Just right. It's down, and then just come up like that, and then just pull it back. Just gently over the surface. So you got them like that. Really okay. Good, yeah. Like a go? Yeah, I would. Yeah, go for yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. Turn it upside down like that. Oh, you know away you go. You know, I was saying that, you know, so many of our familiar dishes seem to come from the royal family. Well, arguably, the royal family were involved in inventing afternoon tea itself. Because it's supposed to be the Duchess of Bedford, who was one of Queen Victoria's ladies in waiting, or ladies of the bedchamber. Uh, who invented it in the 1840s, I think, 1850s, uh, because dinner was getting later and later. Yeah. And they were getting hungry in the afternoons. So she invented afternoon tea. Well, that's what all the dictionaries say. Anyway, I don't know whether, how true it is. So um, I made a bit of a... Yeah, did you see... I, 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 hopefully you didn't see me. You obviously have. I've moved it over to there. Right. <laughs> so so it's not game? near oh, my oh, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I've made a complete shambles of that. <laughs> What do you do? Go I on. didn't press just it Just push down it down enough. a bit more. That's it. Push it down a bit more. Yeah. That's it. Now take it and then just just drag the excess off. Yeah, like that. That's it. Lovely. Lovely. Oh, I like the line you've got going down the middle. Right, it's called it's feathering, that is. Is it? Yeah. Yes. It's better than yours. Yeah, it, it is. Very much better. Mm. Naturally. Mm. Right. In we go. Last one. Yep. Now, you could take these to the fridge, or you could put them in a sort of a cool place and let them set. Mm -hmm. But do you know what? Why? I think that's Why a, would you? That's an absolute waste of time. Absolutely. Mm. Let's get stuck in. Oh, now? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, okay. Let's do it. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Warm chocolate, yeah, cold better. cream, mm. and that lovely shoe paste exterior. Yeah. 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 Oh, hang on. Let's have a little go. Mm -hmm. Oh. How good are they? They're not bad, actually. They're all right. <laughs> no, not bad. No, no, not bad. <laughs> when it comes to afternoon tea, pastry and scones are a must-have. There's only one thing missing, jam. Jam is the unsung hero of any afternoon tea. You can't have a scone without a generous dollop of your favourite preserve. Wilkin and Sons have been making jam in the Essex town of Tiptree since afternoon tea became popular in the late 19th century. To celebrate their 125th anniversary, the Queen came for a factory tour. The day the Queen came, oh, it was just out of this world. Just amazing, really was. The whole of the village had come out, literally, outside of the factory to see her. It's amazing. In charge of Her Majesty's tour was Walter Scott, joint MD of the company, and a jam connoisseur for over 30 years. She was jolly interested in everything. She obviously knew all about the jams and marmalades and, and did actually say that um, she remembers the name Tipperary from the time she was a little girl, um, which, which was quite a, quite a thing, really. The company has a long association with the royal family. It's held a royal warrant for over 100 years. 
These are given as a mark of recognition for producers who supply the household for more than five years. This is our bible of labels, really, of the history of the company right from the beginning. We, we've had the warrant since around 1911, um, but it changes with every monarch. So only the three monarchs in that time. We've got one here by appointment to King George V. Uh, we've gone from King George V there to King George VI here, and then to this one is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Oh, it's a, it, it's a really important thing for us. We're, we're so proud to have it. A passion for a preserve kept the company going through two world wars and tough economic times. And their traditional methods are at the heart of production. This is where all the fruit from whichever source is sorted. It comes from our own farms, it comes from abroad. Copper boiling pans are used, which heat the fruit up faster, allowing the sugars to caramelise. This ensures a perfect jammy flavour. We've got 14 boiling pans, each producing about 70 kilos of jam or marmalade every 10 to 15 minutes. As much of the fruit as possible is grown on site, where the company have been farming for 300 years. Today, farm director Chris Newnham blends old methods with new. We are a very traditional business, and we we cling on to the best of those traditions, you know, so, something like Little Scarlet Strawberry. It's, it's a strawberry variety that we've grown for 120 years, and there is nothing to beat it. So when we have a situation like that, we'll carry on with it. But the way they grow fruit is changing. The company has increased the number of plants by filling their tunnels with rotating tiers. It's a great way of coping with the local weather as well. Well, one of the great challenges that we face in this part of the world is that we're farming in the driest part of the driest county, so water is a real, real issue for us, and it's a great limitation on, on, on growth. Um, one of the beauties of a system like this is that we've got gutters on the roofs, so we're able to harvest all the rainwater that falls in the tunnels. This is a brand new system. It's already leading to a huge increase in fruit production. And that's just as well as these jam makers have noticed that afternoon tea is becoming more and more popular. We export a, a good proportion of our production, probably more than any other UK food company. You're proud of the whole thing, you're proud of the name, but what's inside the pot is important to me. And um, afternoon tea seems to be coming back. There's a bit of a resurgence in it with scones and cream and little scarlet jam on top. One organisation that knows more about afternoon tea than most is the Women's Institute. And I'm here in the Grand Library of the House with Yvonne Brown, who's chairwoman of the Sandringham WI and has had afternoon tea with the Queen loads of times. I have, yes. I've been a member for 25 years and the Queen's been coming to every meeting since 1943, so I've enjoyed many a nice afternoon tea with her. The branch was actually started by Queen Mary, wasn't it? it, it After the First World War? It was started by Queen Mary, and yes. And she used to come along every she year. She did. She was the first And she president. really joined in? She did, yes. She used to like to take tea with the ladies and they even played musical chairs. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, we don't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> the present Queen has been coming since 1943, you said? She became a member in 1943. She came with her mother and Princess Margaret. And how often does she come now? Once a year to the January meeting, and that coincides with the Queen's break at Sandringham. So you know she's coming. Yes. What, what, what preparations do you make? Well, we, you know, get out the best china and the best tablecloths <laughs> and the floral arrangements to make the room look pretty. And um, we make, I make lots of different cakes and things. Um, is that different from the normal meeting? Well, normally we just have a tea and a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it work? Well, the Queen arrives usually at three o'clock and um, we sing the national anthem. We sing Jerusalem. And, and she joins in? She does, yes. And then um, the Queen will give us a short resume of what she's been doing over the past year. And then she takes tea with three ladies. Um, and so she doesn't sit with all of you? No, 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 no. The it, same it three work. ladies? No, not at all. No, this is done in strict rotation. How many years you've been a member and how many attendances you've oh, had. Oh, it's an incentive the year. scheme, oh, is it? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> and what did you serve her? We serve a selection of cheese scones and assorted sponge cakes and eclairs and things. And this year, because it was the Queen's 90th birthday, I made a very special fruitcake for her, which I know she likes. And uh, we were one of the first people, well, I 
think we were the first people to actually serve the Queen with a birthday cake. <laughs> And I've actually brought you one. Oh, just, that's... I thought, you know, you might like to sample one. <laughs> <laughs> Better not in the library here. No, but, no, oh, no. Afterwards, no. certainly. Yeah. So what do you talk about? Um, the Queen, when she sat with the three ladies, she, she talks about almost anything. You know, obviously, there's a lot of horses and things at Sandringham, and she talks about the horses. She'll talk to people about their families, especially some of the people that she's known a long time, because bearing in mind, she has been coming such a long time and so have a lot of the ladies so she does know she probably them knows them well. Well. yes yes she does yeah gosh what do you think she gets out of it i think she gets a really nice relaxing afternoon it's something completely different and from you know her everyday life where she's sort of taken round and visiting different places where she can come there and completely relax a chance to be ordinary perhaps yes yeah. Or as far as the Queen can as be. As far as the Queen can be ordinary. And what about you ladies? What do you get out of it? Well, we get enormous. I mean, we're, we're so honoured and privileged that the Queen is our president. and we, It's just a wonderful day. The highlight of our year, it has to be said. And the next week is back to tea and biscuits. And so. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen must be something of a connoisseur of fruitcake. So much so that royal cake makers will go to extreme lengths to create the perfect cake for a regal afternoon tea. Baker Mitch Turner knows exactly what to do. Mitch Turner has created cakes for many A-list celebrations. Often described as the queen of couture cakes, she's also baked for numerous members of the royal family. In 2010, Mitch was awarded an MBE for services to the catering industry. The recipe I'm going to show you this afternoon is exactly the same as the cake that I made for a larger celebration cake for Her Majesty the Queen. But today, we're going to make it as an afternoon tea cake. Um, for me, afternoon tea wouldn't be afternoon tea without a traditional rich fruit cake. I'm starting with melted butter and sugar, and I'm gonna add a big tablespoon of treacle. People often ask me, do I feel under pressure having baked for members of the royal family? And having the opportunity to celebrate cakes with members of the royal family has been wonderful. Um, you know, I've made a cake for Prince Charles for his birthday. We painted his coat of arms on the side of the cake and we wrote in English and in Welsh, uh, happy birthday, Prince of Wales. And for Her Majesty the Queen, I've made a number of cakes, but particularly and most memorable for me was the diamond wedding anniversary cake that I made for a private royal family Christmas lunch. Um, and then the Queen took the top tier with her to Sandringham to enjoy over Christmas. Um, so this fruit cake really has stood the test of time. Mitch now stirs in eggs and vanilla extract, then sieves flour, adds a raising agent and a combination of spices. I was really honoured to receive an MBE in 2010 for my services to the catering industry. It's one of those most truly wonderful accolades that you can't apply for, enter for, even know that it's going to happen. I was truly, truly overcome. It was a fabulous day to go to Buckingham Palace and receive my MBE. I do wear it with pride. And the main benefits are that my children and my grandchildren can be married and christened in St Paul's Cathedral, which is pretty lovely. Mitch combines the batter with sultanas, currants, raisins, glacé cherries and ginger, which have all been soaked in brandy for 48 hours. Quite often you can have a fruit cake that has a lot of cake with very little fruit in it, whereas mine's the alternative. It's a lot of fruit that's wrapped up in a little bit of cake. Mitch transfers the batter to a lined tin and pops it in the oven. And then after two and three quarter hours, the cake is ready to mould into afternoon tea-sized portions. The cake is baked and it's cooled. So starting right at the edge of the cake, we're going to take that cutter and press really evenly all the way down. The top tip for cutting these out is to ensure that your cutter is nice and clean. If it starts to stick a little bit, you can dip it in some icing sugar. But if the cake is chilled beforehand, that will really, really help. Once divided, Mitch brushes her cake with apricot jam and is ready to apply a base layer of marzipan. Lay that over the surface. The marzipan itself will help to lock in all the moisture inside the cake. Cup it all the way around down to the base. Cut that out, pop it through, and that is the fruit cake ready to have its top coat of icing. Brushing the cake with brandy before icing will not only add flavour, it'll also create an antiseptic barrier that'll help preserve the cake. So that's brushed. Lift the icing up over the surface. And once I get right the way down to the base, take 
the larger size cutter, press down. And that's the cake. Use the smoothers around the edge and on the top to ensure that you've got the perfect finish. And then at this stage, I'm going to put it straight onto a little disc before decoration. Now for the intricate process of decorating the tea cakes. I've made these little afternoon tea cool Britannias for Her Majesty the Queen. As you can see, a labour of love, but certainly worth the effort to show that you've really thought about making that person feel super special. Making these individual crown cakes is so labour intensive that it can take Mitch up to three days to produce a hundred. I'm going to use this uh, to pipe three leaves. As I start piping the leaf, I can give it a little wiggle to bring in the texture. Release and lift up, and that creates the first leaf. Turn to pipe the second, and then the third one here. And what this will do is create three beautiful leaves that cover where the candy stripe started, but most importantly, give me the anchor so that I can bring my red rose into position onto the top of the cake. And that is my afternoon tea crown cake. The rich fruit cake I made for Her Majesty the Queen on a perfect Cool Britannia. Fruit cake can be rich, and sometimes a plainer bun goes down better in the afternoon. At the time of Buckingham Palace kitchen maid Mildred Nichols, the Queen sent down a request to the kitchen. It was a recipe for bath buns. A hundred years and more ago, our kitchen maid, our Buckingham Palace kitchen maid, Mildred Nichols, seemed to spend most of her time doing puddings and desserts, if her recipe book is anything to go by. And look at this, Paul. This is really fascinating, because a loose leaf in the recipe book is a recipe actually sent down by the Queen to the kitchens, a recipe for bath the buns. The Queen sent this recipe yep, down? Yep, yep, to her. Wow. And she's got it in here. Yeah. It's a recipe, though, for bath buns. It's a very simple recipe, and actually, no disrespect, quite a plain thing, a bath bun. It is a very simple recipe, as you've pointed out, but what makes it special is this here. Mm. And this is what we now know as a ferment, a starter, when you're making bread. They would call it a sponge. And in there, Michael, is fresh yeast, milk warmed, not to kill the yeast, just warmed, sugar and flour. And that there is like a really sour, yogurty kind of like, it's just fermenting. It's really delicious. And this is Mildred's recipe on the instructions of absolutely, the Queen. Yeah, absolutely, which is, which is brilliant. That's quite a thought. Isn't so it? we've got our sugar, mm -hmm. our eggs, and some butter. And this is yeah, simply known as creaming. So we're just going to pop that down there and start it off nice and slowly. Once we start starts going together, we can just take that speed up slightly. It's taking off. Mildred, presumably, would have done this with elbow power, wouldn't Yeah, you? yeah. absolutely. Would have taken a lot longer? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next bit. Yeah. We are now just going to... We're going to change our paddle for a dough hook. Because now we don't want to beat air into it, Michael. We just want to form a dough. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to pop that in there like that. In with our flour. Yeah. OK, so just plain flour. Yeah. Now we're going to very gently... You see that it's just rising and rising and rising. <laughs> I'm just going to pop that in there. And it's important to get all of this in. Mm. Get all of that in. Yeah. Into, I don't know if you can smell it. It smells like yeah. beer. Yeah, it does, actually. Yeah. Quite exciting. OK, down. Yeah. And this bit, just gently. And what we're doing... What this is going to do now is knead. Yeah. That'll take about a couple of minutes. Yeah. But what we're also doing, we're working the gluten in the flour. Because yeah. we don't want we, we don't want to just bind it together. We now need to kind of slowly knock it, what we call knocking it, so to kind of we work that gluten. It's quite interesting the kind of social history of all this because uh, this recipe came at a time when uh, the royal family were, were getting a bit more austere. You know, some of the extravagance was uh, being put behind them. Right. Uh, and uh, Queen Mary, in particular, she was a real stickler, and she would measure out the tea leaves for the cups of tea for her afternoon tea, and she'd insist on doing it herself. Right. And that, Michael, is our dough. <laughs> As Mildred would have made it. Absolutely. She must have spent, you know, 
uh, most of her working life doing afternoon tea for Queen Mary, the wife of uh, yeah. King George V. She wasn't always appreciative, you know. She was that stickler. And we've actually got a note from her sent down to the kitchens, not necessarily to Mildred, and about bath buns. And she says here, the bath buns were very good when sent to Windsor last Friday, but yesterday they were again not good. They tasted too much of brioche, not bread. In other words, too fancy French and not enough plain English, do you think? Mm, think not a very a... nice note for Mildred to get if it was aimed at her. No, um, absolutely. Well, do you know what? I think it probably does resemble more towards a brioche than, <laughs> than it does a bread anyway. <laughs> You'd so have I'm got with... the same sort of uh, note, would I'm you? With... I would have got the same note. I'm with Mildred. <laughs> yeah. Right, here we go. So we've got this. So we're just going to knead it now. Just <laughs> gently knead it like that, like so. Do that for about a couple of minutes. Yeah. Into a nice circle, like that, straight into our bowl. Yeah. And over here, tea towel cling film over yeah. the top. And over here, it's now doubled inside. It's risen. Absolutely. And how long does it take to do that? That will take about half an hour. So you've got this, you've just got this kind of beautiful dough that's increased in size. Now what we do is just pull it out gently on our, gently onto the board like that, okay? And again, we'd knock it, what we call knocking it back again. But it's What's just getting for? lighter you, and lighter. So we're taking for? the air out, and then it's just so it's basically rising again, yeah. rising again. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you just grab, just grab about that much. Yeah. There, Got and it. then roll that into a little. Like this. Absolutely, just perfectly like that. Just, just nice and round. Yeah. yeah. Keep it nice and tight, just in your palm. Well, Queen Mary would like mine. Not sure about yours. Wow. <laughs> oh, she look. wasn't that fussy, was she? <laughs> <laughs> look, mine's so much better than yours. Right. You put them on here? Pop them onto the tray. There we go. Okay. Now, no, a bit more space apart because right. they're going to prove again. Oh, they're going to Okay. Expand. And the reason we do that, Michael, is so that the dough isn't chewy. Mm. Okay. So this will go into the oven for 15 minutes at 200 degrees. Quite so a hot quite oven. a hot yeah, heat, yeah. so they bake quickly. Yep. Oh, then wow. You have these. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those. Look how they've puffed up. Yeah, yeah. light, sweet, delicious. They're ready to serve now? No, we just need to glaze them now. So over here, we have some golden syrup that we've just let down with a little bit of water. <laughs> it's Mildred recipe. <laughs> <laughs> so, literally, Michael, just yeah. straight, just dab it over. Dab it on the top. Absolutely, yeah, all over our buns, mm -hmm. like so. Bit of shine on the Absolutely. top of the thing. Absolutely. And it also, I was about to say spice up, but sweetens up what is otherwise a relatively plain... It is, it is quite, it is quite plain, but like I say, the secret is in that lovely ferment that's in these buns and that almost that kind of sweet sour note with the yeast. Delicious. Really good for a, a, a lighter afternoon tea. I think, like you say, it's interesting, isn't it, how the taste's kind of almost yeah. got more simple or yeah. not so extravagant as, as time went on. Yeah. So we've got our last one here. There we go. They look rather marvellous, don't they? They do, don't they? They, are, they look absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Right. What's next? Pearl sugar. Oh. Basically, like little crunchy icing sugar. Mm -hmm. And then straight on like that. Mm. Don't they look fabulous? They do. Also gives a nice texture, because you've got that sort of nice soft bun. Yes, because everything else is soft, and this will be a crispy crust Absolutely. That lovely sticky glaze. Mm. Yeah. All right. Lovely. Right. There we Can are. Can we now? Now look Have an at afternoon those. tea nibble. Yes. yes. Go for it. Get stuck in. No, after you. This go time. on. Then. Okay. No, no, go on. All right. Which one? Which one? This one here. Yeah, okay. I'll this take this one, one to keep it neat. Look at that. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> oh, good as mm. <laughs> so, Hang on. You've got a moustache. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Another fine mess you've got me into. <laughs> <laughs> Royal food served on the grandest tables is so much more than just a meal. Historically, these extravagant dishes were created to represent power. They also set fashions. Nowadays, Royal food is all about showcasing the best of British. In celebration of royal food, we know it's the Queen's recipe because we've got it in our own hand. From the present and the past. That is proper regal. We recreate old family favourites. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. What yep. a mess. We sample royal eating al fresco. Oh, wow. That <laughs> yeah. is what you want. 
and revisit the most extravagant times. Pheasant, stag, turkey, salmon, oysters and turbot dressed in a lobster champagne sauce. Unbelievable! This is Royal Recipes. Hello, I'm Michael Burke and welcome to Royal Recipes. This is Audley End, one of Britain's finest stately homes, built in the style of a royal palace and once owned by a king. In the splendour of the gardens, halls and kitchen of this grandest of country houses, we'll be recreating the food served at the highest royal tables. And it all starts here with this gem, a royal kitchen maid's cookbook, the only surviving recipe book of its kind in the royal archive. This is an exact copy of the original, which is kept at Windsor Castle. Inside, the recipes of Mildred Nichols, who worked at Buckingham Palace in the early 1900s. And for the first time in over a hundred years, we'll be bringing these recipes back to life. This time, we cook food served at the biggest royal spectacle of all, the coronation. Today, here in the Royal Recipes kitchen, Michelin star chef Paul Ainsworth creates his version of the most famous coronation dish of all. If there's something that's improved over the last 50 or so years, it's coronation chicken. The daughter of Britain's first television cook recreates her mother's coronation recipes, including melon balls. You press firmly in, you pray, you turn, and, hey presto, a ball. And chef Anna Ha discovers how not to fish for royal coronation salmon. Catch me a fish. We'll get you a fish. In the kitchen wing of this stately home, food from the most excessive coronation feast in British history to the more restrained menu of the present Queen's coronation meal. Hello. This is the historic kitchen, and joining me is Michelin-starred chef Paul Ainsworth. What do you think of it? It's fantastic. What a wonderful kitchen. Now, Paul, when I mention the coronation, what do you think? It's got to be chicken, hasn't it? <laughs> it's coronation got be, chicken. got to be coronation chicken. Yeah, served at the Queen's coronation and with us ever since. Absolutely. And there it is. But it looks pink. Yeah, well, this one is Rosemary Hume, so she invented the coronation chicken. Um, Back she, in the 50s? Yeah, wonderful food writer. Well, why is it pink? Because of red wine, um, which is unusual, which isn't present in the modern recipe. Yeah, um, normally they're quite yellow, aren't they? Yeah. And is that what you're going to do for us today? And that's what I'm going to cook for you today, a beautiful version of coronation chicken. So this is your modern take on it? Yeah. The original version is quite heavy. So what we've got over here, we've got two chicken breasts. Yeah. And this is a lovely way of cooking chicken. We're just poaching. Yeah. So it's Keep keeping it, moist, it lovely though. and moist, but we've got a fragrant stock. We've got some coconut milk, some kaffir lime leaves, lemongrass, ginger, a little bit of salt, chicken stock. And basically, it's great to do at home, bring it up to a simmer, turn the gas off, and then just let it poach for about 15 minutes, and that chicken breast will be so succulent. But those kind of um, ingredients, lemongrass and all that sort of thing, we never even heard of those in no, 1953. I mean, and, and the whole idea of this is, is it's more southern India, so it's lovely yeah. and fragrant. Next, we've got this delicious coronation sauce. Now, I've already sweated down the onion. What I mean by sweating is we've just cooked without colour. And in it, I've added some turmeric, some mango chutney, and the some turmeric curry gives powder. it that yellow. Uh... Gives it that cut, but as you can see, not too much. Yeah. The curry powder's given us that little kick and that nice heat. Now, what's great about this dish? We're using all of the flavours, so it's just two pots, so nice and simple to do at home. <laughs> Literally, we're just going to ladle some of our delicious stock that our chicken's been cooking. So you can see, like, we're using all of the flavours. Can you see it's not that yep. kind of real bright yellow? Have a sniff. Yeah, absolutely. Go in. Oh, so the onions, the spices. Yeah. Now, all we're going to do is reduce that right down so we get this. And this is the wonderful <laughs> coronation chicken, almost like paste. But you see, it's a deep colour. It's not that horrible yeah. yellow. Absolutely delicious. Really rich. So we're going to go into our bowl. And the reason I've let it cool down because we're going to add mayonnaise and yoghurt. And if you were to add that hot, then you would split them out. Mm. So we're going to have some mayonnaise, which is absolutely delicious. Some yoghurt. 
the yogurt giving it a lovely acidity and the mayonnaise giving it nice body and nice richness. Bring those together. So different from the one in 1953, isn't it? The Absolutely. one in 1953, interestingly enough, it was considered pretty exotic at the time. Do you know it was only served to the foreign guests at the coronation? Right, OK. <laughs> it was and far was too exotic for us. Well, I suppose it was too spicy for British tastes. So now you can see we've got this beautiful sauce. Delicious. So I've cooked two breasts. You've got all that. Now these kind of aromats, they've done their job now. That lovely ginger, kaffir lime, you can smell that lemongrass. Absolutely delicious. And it's as easy as this. I'm just going to plate out. Now I like to carve the chicken, just so I can show you it inside, just like that. Now look at that. Oh, do you wow. just look how juicy and succulent <laughs> that is? Oh, it's exciting. Lovely. OK? Yeah. And that's it, just as it... Two, and, and you know what? It's just about... It's... it's Refinement, that's all it is, just taking your time with it, nice ingredients. I mean, that chicken there is just so moist and tender and just full of all that flavour from that lovely aromatic broth. And now all I want to do is just take some of that wonderful coronation sauce. Not a lot of it, because it's nice, we don't want to take away too much from the chicken and not drown it, you know? Yeah. We want, we want it to taste the chicken as well as that lovely coronation sauce. You've got that wonderful acidity coming from the, coming from the yoghurt as well, a little bit from the mayonnaise. We're just going to finish that over with some lovely coriander and with some lovely toasted almonds. That gives us nice crunch, nice texture, and the almonds go so beautiful with the chicken. A dish and you fit, know what? fit for a king, fit for a queen? I think so. So, Paul, the moment of truth. Absolutely. Eh? The past against the present. Rosemary <laughs> against I like Paul. That. The past <laughs> against the present. Do you have a taste? Yeah, the past first, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the Queen didn't have this, of course. It was only the foreign guests at the coronation. It's not that bad, is it? Right. It's a bit bland. A bit bland, mm. yeah. Oh. And quite that sort of. Fattiness from the mayonnaise. Yeah, it's so. kind of very rich. Mm. Very rich. And the rice doesn't kind of take it up. Oh. Well, that's a good start. Because <coughs> I'm glad you don't like rosemary. <laughs> no, <I don't, laughs> no, no, I wouldn't be disrespectful. Oh, really? But, no, but, no, Should we no, try this right. one? Yeah. Would you like me to cut you a piece? So you get a bit of, get a bit of everything. I want a bit of everything. There we go. There we go. Oh, can I have that one? Yeah, go for it. And what about you? There we go. Mm. Oh, that is special. There's the texture of the chicken. Chicken. Really very moist. But it's that aromatic, mm. you know, the lemongrass, the Because the chicken's lime. almost like... like a sponge, really porous -y. And that's... it's important to get that salt into the stock as well, but you... all the flavours that are in there you can taste. And then you've got that lovely mild sauce, which has got that wonderful acidity from the yoghurt. It's brilliant. It's really nice. If there's something that's improved over the last 50 or so years... Thank you. It's Coronation Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Paula. Yeah. I love it. Good. It's certainly a light and aromatic dish. I think it would appeal to a modern monarch's palate. A celebratory coronation banquet always showcases ingredients from around the United Kingdom. Lamb from Wales and, of course, salmon from Scotland, where the royals seem to love fishing for it as much as eating it. Goon Palace in Perthshire is an ancient site of royal coronations. A perfect place for chef Anna Ha to try her hand at salmon fishing. Scone Palace is on the banks of the River Tay, which is the largest river in Britain, and it's full of salmon. And I'm determined to catch one today, or at least try. Scottish salmon is famous world over. Ian Kirk is a ghillie who's been fishing the waters here for years. How are you? I'm doing fine yourself. Yeah, great. Nice to meet you. And you. So you're here to catch a fish? Yep. I plan on catching a salmon today. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's the right time of year. It's the right place to do it. So we'll get you kitted out. And if our luck's in, our luck's in. OK. Anna may be more familiar with cooking salmon than catching it. But suited and booted, she certainly looks the part. So why is it such a good place to fish here? It's October and that is the peak of the salmon season. That's what I want. Because the salmon like to hold up here at this time of year. Simple as that. But at the moment they're coming in from the sea and they're heading upstream and we get first crack at them. 
Schoon Palace owns a six-mile stretch of this prime salmon fishing territory. Oh, it's beautiful here. Yeah, it's quite special. Especially at this time of year with the trees turning a beautiful shade of rust and yeah. red. Uh, yeah, this is the, we term this has been the lower tay. It's not as deep as people think. Huh. It's quite shallow, average depth, six, seven feet here. Huh. Yeah. So it'll only be up to my waist then, really, eventually? Yeah. Like Maybe, with your heels on, eh? <laughs> so, let's put your glasses and we'll get you, we'll get you started. <laughs> OK, let's go. OK, OK. The shades reduce glare from the water, which makes it easier to spot the fish, in theory, anyway. And it's a nice C-shape, wonderful. And rotate on the telephone. Kind of. Kind of. First part was fantastic. The second part was horrible. <laughs> Great. Under Ian's expert guidance, right. Anna channels Great. her inner Wonderful. fisherwoman. Rotate the body. Oh. Up, two, three. Nearly. Now you've done that. You've done that pushing thing again. Yeah. How come you use this technique to, to catch salmon? Well, fly fishing is the most artistic. It's the most balearic. It's the most graceful form of catching a salmon. What's so special about Scottish salmon? The, the wild Scottish salmon, the texture of the flesh, a fresh wild Scottish salmon is a thing to behold. When you, you'll know yourself, James, when you cook it, when even when you're cooking it, and the taste, the meatiness, the flavour, it's just perfect. You think there's something special in this waters that makes it, you know, more delicious? Clean water, good feeding, hmm. um, and good breeding habitat. Hmm. Both, that's it. That's what makes them so special, hmm. absolutely. Catch me a fish. We'll get you a fish. Anna gets the hang of casting, but despite her best efforts, the salmon stay tantalisingly out of reach. Look at that. That was two at once. It looks like Anna's heading home empty-handed, though some people are known to have better luck. So I know that the royals love to eat salmon. Um, mm. So I've also heard that they like to fish for salmon. I do know that they're very much into their salmon fishing. They've got properties right beside some of the best salmon rivers in Scotland. You think that's an accident? No, <laughs> it's definitely not. It's definitely not an accident. You know, when you when you are that say stature, I want the house here. Why? Because it's a river. And oh, I like and I like to fish for salmon. So for my first experience of salmon fishing, it's been amazing. I mean, I could understand why people would want to come here and get lost for a day or a half a day, just feeling the kind of the beauty around them, but also the the fabulous experience of every splash of a salmon passing by. It is wonderful. It may not have been a catch fit for royalty, but the river has cast its spell on our chef. I just knew she wasn't going to catch a fish, didn't you? It's not that she did it badly, they're camera shy. Absolutely. <laughs> well, clearly Anna's fish is here. Yeah. <laughs> this is the one that got away. Yeah. <laughs> These menu cards Paul, from several coronations, yeah. uh, show that the same dishes crop up time and time again, salmon particularly. Here's the Queen's um, father, George VI, his coronation, 1937, yeah. Rosette de Saumon uh, l'Ecossaise, uh, Scottish yeah. salmon, obviously, yeah. and second course, same, for the Queen's coronation, Rosette de Saumon Edinburgh. Must Amazing. be the same thing, only it's obviously yeah. some tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, but it's yeah. the same thing, isn't it? Scottish salmon, rosettes. Yeah, I think growing up as a kid, like, you always associate salmon with the royal family. You know, like, some good... Uh, they fish it? Amazing they, they eat Scottish it. Salmon. But is it easy? Yeah, absolutely. And you're going to have a go today as well. You're going to help me rather than just watching... OK, come on. Right, ready? Now, yeah, absolutely. So, now, now, rosettes, noisettes, medallions? Rosettes, so basically rose. So yeah. we're going to roll it. So I think a very okay, royal thing, very yeah. regal. So we've got some beautiful Scottish salmon. Mm. And what we've done in what we call is a gravelax. I don't really know what gravelax is. Scandinavian. Yeah. Because it's a way back in the day before fridges how they would keep fish. Yeah. Uh, and the recipe is salt, honey, and whiskey in this instance. It sounds more like curing. It's curing Absolutely. The, 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 yeah. the salmon. So it's a great way of preserving, basically taking you through the winter. It's very simple. It's just equal quantities of sugar, yeah. some lovely Scottish sea salt beautiful Scottish heather honey, and then we've got some single malt whiskey. And what we've done, we just put equal quantities of salt, sugar, and then we add in a little bit of honey, just a little bit of whiskey. It's not a weighed amount, just to you make a paste. So, we're going to take our salmon. Yep. I'm going to cut a couple of slices, and then I'm going to hand some Very over thinly. to you. Very thin. Very thin, because it is cooked, 
yeah. but it's cooked with the salt and the sugar. Cured rather than cooked. I yeah, suppose. no, well, no, it is, it is cooked. Yeah. That's so it's like it's like ham. So we've just got a couple of slices. You're doing it very carefully. Like that. And what you basically want to do, Michael, is take the small end here. Yeah. And then just roll it. And it's not actually that fiddly, but can you imagine doing this on a banquet scale? Yeah, this is the thing. I can, you know, you're doing this, but if you're doing it for several hundred people, presumably they do it days and days in advance. No, they? they wouldn't. They wouldn't because you, you want to get this nice and fresh and you wouldn't want it to dry out. So we're just rolling them up like this. And it, can you see rosette? Yeah. It basically resembles... It looks like a rose. A little like rose. Yeah. And then just, these are like your petals at the top. Just pull them out like that. Right. Do you want to have a go? <laughs> Can you trust me with that knife? Absolutely. With this lovely it's very salmon? sharp, but okay. I'll watch. I'll watch over you. <laughs> all right. I just get my finger. Yeah. In. Just the go. salmon, no fingers. No. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Adding it a bit of body. That's Literally. It. That's there we it. go. Nice and thin. Brilliant. It's very very thin. All right. Well, sort of. Yeah. I was getting a bit clumsy there. And then you roll it up. They are a slightly thick, so you'd want them to be a bit thinner. Right. And then you, you widen it out at the top. Yeah, you see, if you go a bit thinner, you'll get more of a you'll get more of a roast. But do you know what? That's fantastic. <laughs> 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 all right. Very good. What do you think? Very good. Yeah. What do you think? They're all right. As it's you, we'll let them pass. They're, they're your ones. All right, chef. <laughs> you what can eat those. <laughs> right, moving over here. Yep. Horseradish. Yep. Creme fraiche. Yep. The two things go so well together. We're going to add all of that in there and we're just going to mix it. Is it just it. a matter of the creme fraiche diluting the power of the horse? Absolutely. Yeah. Creme fraiche, nice and creamy, but it has a wonderful acidity. Yeah. And that's what goes really nice. Because that's got, that salmon is actually, believe it or not, it's, quite, it's got quite a, almost like a fat taste. You know, really nice, mm. but quite rich. So we just want something to really cut it. A bit of bite to it. Absolutely. And horseradish also contains this wonderful acidity. Yeah. Which goes Isn't really there a danger nice. that the very powerful horseradish taste overwhelms the subtlety of the salmon? Not really, because you want what you want and like with anything we can, is balance. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have too much of, of one thing. You want to balance them out. So we've got some wonderful Scottish oat cakes. We're just going to lay them on our plate like so. It really is a Scottish dish, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And basically, just a little bit... Are you put the horseradish on first? Yeah, I'm going to put the horseradish on first because the salmon will sit nice, but also it's a nice little surprise. So when you bite into this canapé, you then just get this wonderful, creamy hit of the horseradish. So we're going like so. It's quite now, simple, if you want to grab yeah. your rosettes there, yep. grab your rosettes there. Yeah. Okay, and just and plonk play, them on the top. Literally like that. Just plonk them on the top. No messing around. Mine looks an industrial version to yours, doesn't it? <laughs> there we go. These look. Mine look like roses. Yours look like tulips. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now take some watercress. Yep. And again, this isn't here just for show. This is here for flavour. Watercress, lovely and peppery. My favourite salad. And then you know what? Mm. We're just going to get some of that lovely heather honey that's yep. in the salmon and then just go over our salmon. So you get these little hit of sweetness as well when you go over. Can Shall I... we dig in? Let's yep. go. I'm going to have my fat one. Go on, go for it. There you go. Oh. Mmm. 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 Great, aren't they? Mmm. Niddle bit of horseradish. Mm. You've got that lovely texture of the salmon. Mm. The different textures. And a bit of sharpness. Oh. Texture of the yolk. Everything that's in everything that's there you can taste and it's all working beautifully together. Mm. 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 You can actually taste, you can certainly taste the honey. A bit of a flavour of whiskey. Yeah. They're as current now as they were back then, and that is absolutely delicious. Keep talking. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Mm. <laughs> Mm. You're enjoying that, aren't you, Michael? Mm. Yeah, that's no, good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Delicate rosettes of salmon, not too showy or extravagant. A change in style and symbolic of a different way of celebrating royal coronations. June 2nd, 1953, witnessed a unique event, a televised coronation. It was the first major live broadcast shown across the country, and 27 million people tuned in. The nation came to a standstill. Friends and families flocked to the homes which had one of these new television sets. One of those watching was Judith Patton, the daughter of Marguerite, television personality, and one of the most influential cooks in British history. 
Judith and historian Dr. Polly Russell are going back in time to cook the dishes Marguerite created for home cooks to serve as they watch the pageant on television. And where better to cook than in a house decorated with 50s flair? Oh, my goodness. Gosh, this is amazing. It yeah, really is, isn't it? Wow. Is this reminiscent of your own home in the 50s? No, we were a little more calmed down. Yeah, this uh, is, But this is incredible. This is sort of like intense 50s, isn't it? It is. Judith has only distant memories of the day, a table groaning with food and minute images on the television. Imagine we're looking at that tiny television yeah. there. So you're watching dinky little things, the size of dinky toys going past yeah, yeah. with rain. I think probably eating would have been a good it's thing okay. to do. Your mother, yeah. two weeks before the coronation, used the television programme to present a meal which she suggested viewers could cook a day in advance of the coronation and then have ready to serve on the day and actually eat while watching the television so that nobody had to miss anything. Looking at the menu that she produced, I would have, I think, eaten the cheese straws. Right. There was coronation chicken, but I think I would have turned my nose up at that. But she also had got an avocado dip and God only knows what. So, so it's a kind of menu that was, you know, very much a kind of special buffet for this amazing day. This sort of really a banquet in the home for, for a whole nation. It's very sort of telling of its time, sort of melon balls. Oh, melon balls, those are good. I can, I can, do, really? I can do those. Can yeah. you, do, you can do a pattern special oh, melon yes, balls. Yes, yes. Marguerite played a vital role in improving British cooking after the war. Her coronation menu typically mixed traditional favourites with exotic delicacies. We're going to try and replicate some of the food that your mother cooked for the coronation in 1953. We've got some right. of the ingredients here. Avocados, they obviously featured for your mum, didn't they? They in did, West because East. in the very first book she ever wrote for Harrods, which I think was sort of 47, 48, yeah. you open it up, there on the very first page of recipes is an avocado recipe. It's really interesting because my sort of... my imagination of the 1950s is that avocados avocado would have been pretty rare. Zone. We're going to make the melon cocktail that your mother served mm -hmm. okay. and we're also going to make the seafood rice ramekin as well. Right. You are going to teach me how to boil a melon for a right. melon cocktail. Okay. Right, so we're going to need to have You melon. need a melon, yeah. you need a knife. You've made quite a big play about the melon balls, Judith. And I so should learn to keep quiet. <laughs> So we've got a melon baller for you here. Right, this is a beautifully ripe melon. You press firmly in, you pray, you turn, and hey presto, a ball. That is fantastic. Wartime rationing was still in force in 1953, but Marguerite's recipes were cleverly designed to make the smallest luxuries stretch a long way. In the 1950s, you know, to serve this for a coronation, you know, it's nice and light and, I mean, not exactly sort of revolutionary, but nevertheless, if you've been used to the kind of stodgy food of wartime austerity Britain, okay. very pleasant. And who taught you this? I think it was a bit like mother's milk. It just came, came on board. Really? Yes. Let me just see if I can do it. You go for it. Well, no. It isn't as easy as it seems. No, no. See, now I, think, I suddenly no. feel like... I was I... feeling quite smug, and yet yes. now I've got a flat-bottomed ball, and that's not There's a, a dance one. that no, goes with that. Flat-bottomed <laughs> ball. <laughs> well, shall I start putting them in the glass? Yeah. Do you want to do the orange? OK. I think just... With her coronation cuisine, Marguerite was perhaps unwittingly creating the first TV dinner. And yep. now we're going to bake a uh, seafood rice ramekin. Do you want to put that into the ramekin? Okay. And then it has breadcrumbs over the top. Right. A mixture of crab meat, prawns and rice with cream and mayonnaise. This was a dish designed to be made in advance and eaten hot or cold whilst watching the big event. It looks delicious. On with the breadcrumbs. These look fabulous, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah, I think that's a fitting tribute to your mother and also, you know, it does say something about the food of that time. You know, that actually is a classic example as well of just how you would take very simple ingredients and you produce something that really looks pretty. Yeah, it's lovely. Not everyone was watching the coronation on TV screens. Some had an even better view as one former choir boy recalls. Martin Neary here was, was actually at the 
coronation. You were 13 years old and a chorister at the service. He was one of the Chapel Royal choristers. What can you remember about that day? How did it start? Well, it started, I perhaps should begin, with the night before, because we actually were brought back to London to go and sleep on the floor of the chapel so that we would be able to be present early in the morning and not worry about the thronging crowds preventing us getting there. What I do remember was that we were given a very good breakfast, eggs and bacon, in the chapel. And that was meant to keep us going for the next six hours because we left St James's Palace at 7.30 in the morning to go to Westminster Abbey where we had a practice. And then we had quite a long wait because the processions took an enormous time to get through. And we actually sang the, the litany in procession at about half past 10. So it was, that was two and a half hours later, and the service still hadn't uh, begun. And you couldn't take any snacks or anything like no, that to keep your strength up? they were forbidden. One or two people may have sneaked something in, but I'm not too sure. We certainly didn't. What we were given were glucose tablets, which were very much the flavour of the month in those days. What is your memory of the service? The outstanding memory, very briefly. Uh, the outstanding memory of being present at this historic occasion, never to be forgotten, having a wonderful view. We were positioned in the gallery so that we could see the Queen coming through, going up to the altar, seeing the crowning of Her, Her Majesty. And to be present for that was just unique, really. And what about afterwards, after this huge, long service and all that you'd done? Did you, did you get a chance to join in with the, with the coronation meal, with the coronation chicken? No, we didn't, actually. I heard later that the men had been offered the chance of having a buffet lunch at Church House, for which they had to pay a pound. But we were just driven back to the St James's Palace, actually en route via the Mall, where we were able to see the royal processions, which was lovely. When we got back to the chapel, we were able then to receive our medals. But no food. But we had to wait until we got home for more sustenance. A bit aggrieved about that. Do you know, I don't think it occurred to us. We'd actually experienced something quite unique I was really totally enamoured with the music and I still, when I conduct things now, think back to those occasions when I play those pieces of that moment when the Queen came in and we hear the first notes of I Was Glad of Parry and it takes you back 63 years. Still? It still does. The Coronation Chicken might have done too, you know. Well, I'm glad to say that I have sampled Coronation Chicken since but that was when I was considerably older. Martin Neary, thanks very much. When it comes to extravagance, few monarchs can compete with George IV. His coronation banquet was arguably the most over-the-top feast ever held. Historian Dr Matthew Green is treading in the footsteps of this, the most famous royal eater. Supposedly known as Old Naughty, Prince George finally got his hands on power when his father, George III, descended into his final spell of madness in 1811. At his beloved royal pavilion in Brighton, the Prince Regent had a reputation for laying on the most extravagant banquets. So it's no surprise his coronation was the biggest feast in history. Hi, David. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. A fantastic place. Isn't it astonishing? David Beavers is keeper of the royal pavilion and is taking Matt to the grand banqueting room, which gives some idea of George's dining habits. Wow. Look at this. This is, you often hear historical buildings described as mesmerizing and opulent, uh, but this really takes the biscuit. Yeah, it is one of the most astonishing rooms in England. It was finished in about 1818, 1819, um, and is a sort of monument to George's love of food and overindulgence. So to modern sensibilities, this seems almost unimaginably lavish, uh, but in George's world, this wasn't kind of the scene of his most lavish banquet. That took place elsewhere, didn't it? It did, at Westminster Hall in 1821, after the coronation. So that was his coronation banquet? Coronation banquet. 1821. He decided not to have it here. Why was yeah, that? Well, because traditionally the coronation banquets were held in Westminster Hall, but his okay. was the last. It was the greatest and most spectacular coronation banquet in the whole of English history. George uh, turned it into, as, as here, a kind of fantasy vision of the world that he wanted it to, wow. to be. The expenditure was 
It was around £240,000. £240,000. How much yes. in today's money is that roughly equivalent to? Well, it's been computed to be about £20 million. Pounds. £20 million. Yes. Pounds. 350 people dined in the hall. Mm. Um, and I was a bit puzzled. 350 people, but 9,000 bottles of wine were received. 9,000. Wow, so now, how many is that each? Ah, uh, but um, <laughs> uh, 350 dined in the hall, but 2,000 others dined in elsewhere in the Palace of Westminster, in the House of Lord, oh, okay. House of Commons in various other I saw rooms these meals all over Westminster. There, there was all over the place. At the time of George's coronation, Britain was the richest, most powerful country in the world. Yes. And George wanted to make sure that he, as king, represented England. It's no surprise that George built the very finest kitchen, fit for a king and one of the most famous chefs of all time. So here we are in the kitchen. Wow, this is where the magic happened and my first impression of this is it's quite a show kitchen you know, there's a great sense of space it's very well lit you've got those beautiful row of windows up there it's not as though it's been buried away so is, is that true is that the kind of place where people it's, come and watch the it's one of the first show kitchens and george was very proud of it George himself, when he was the regent or even when he was the king, would he have come down here? He famously came here on one and possibly two occasions. A red carpet was put on the, in, on the floor here. They laid a red carpet. They laid a red carpet and his chefs and scullions uh, served him. But there was for a time a celebrity chef who worked here as well. Um, who was he? Uh, Marie-Antoine Carême. He liked to be called Antonine Carême. Uh, the most famous chef of all time, probably the first celebrity chef. So he was um, the, if you like, the sort of Jamie Oliver of the, the Jamie Oliver early of, 19th century. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he was recruited in Paris uh, by the Prince Regent. So it was quite a catch to get this absolutely. celebrity chef. It netted this man who cooked for Napoleon, cooked for the Tsar of Russia. It didn't work out in the long term, did it? He only lasted about a year. So no, he wrong? was here less than a year. What went wrong is partly the pavilion was a building site. It rained most of the time it was here. So he was working in a rain-lashed building site, not very nice. But the main reason he, 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 he went back to France was he was homesick. George may have lost his star chef, but his love of food grew and grew. His weight reached 20 stone and his waist 50 inches. I've got here an account uh, from the Duke of Wellington about George's almost last meal. And this is just a week or so before he died. And this is what he had for breakfast. Two pigeons, three beefsteaks, three quarters of a bottle of Moselle, a glass of champagne, two glasses of port, and a glass of brandy for breakfast. Wow. Now, one can either say what gross extravagance, or one could say what an appetite for life the man had. And if that was for breakfast, I dread to think what he had well, for dinner. The legacy of George's love of food lives on. A hundred years later, Buckingham Palace kitchen maid Mildred Nichols has recipes by royal chef Karem in her notebook including this rich dessert, creme à la carême, a likely favourite of the gourmand king. Not exactly a picky eater, was he? Far from it. <laughs> Far from it. Death by knife and fork Pure and glass, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. But he was ahead of the game with this French chef, wasn't he? Monsieur Carême. I think invented haute cuisine. So it's no surprise, really, that some of his recipes actually feature in this wonderful old recipe book from the kitchen maid at Buckingham Palace, Mildred Nichols. And here we are, you know, in her fountain pen. You know, the spelling's not very good, but creme à la carême. Not much detail here, though, is there? It's just it's not. four lines. Is there something there for you to build on? Hugely. And I am so excited about showing you this dish. Right, so what we've got is we've got some lovely sponge fingers and orange jelly. That's the first part of this dish. So what we're going to do, Michael, is just dip the fingers into the jelly and they basically, we just build those around the edge. You can see I've started some yeah. already. They're like soldiers, aren't they, around, yeah, the, around the edge there? They are, they're lovely. And the, the jelly just soaks into the sponge and that really is our base that's going to like sit right the way around. This is not going to be Weight Watchers dish of the week, is it? Not this one, no. no. This really is a great dinner party dish because it's got such a wow factor. And this jelly is not complicated. This is just the packet jelly. You know, the stuff you had as a kid that I would eat raw yeah. before yeah. it was in jelly, like it was sweets. The new Michelin starred chef are uh, admitting this, are you? You're getting your jelly out of a packet? Absolutely. <laughs> What other, no, I better not ask you what other shortcuts you do. No, we've got these lovely fingers going all the way around. Yep. Now, with the excess orange jelly, we're just going to pour that into the base. Yeah. 
So when we turn it out, we're going to have this wonderful you're go set jelly on top. So it really is, really has got a wonderful wow factor to it. And now just to add a bit more indulgence, we're going to add some Kirsch. Just with a brush, gently up the side. You're going to brush it, you're not going to slosh it on. No, no. Got that lovely orange working round and we've got that lovely Kirsch working in right into the sponge like that. Lovely. OK, and it's, it's so lovely. Orange, that lovely cherry light liquor. Beautiful. Now, if I could just give you that, Michael, yep. and we're Here just we go. going to set that in the fridge. OK. And while you're gone, I'm going to start the creme anglaise. I'll be back in two ticks. Excellent. Now, this is what I'd call custard, is it? This is custard, exactly. Doesn't look like custard. No, and it's, it's basically not the powdered version. We're going to make a proper not, fresh Not out version. of a packet this time. Not out of a packet this time, <laughs> although I do like that as well. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> right, so in here we're going to have egg yolks. Yep. OK. Straight in like that. Sugar. Yeah. Ordinary sugar? Castle Ordinary sugar. sugar. And then on here we've got vanilla and milk, and we're just going to bring that to a boil. We're not going to, like, like scalding boil, just to a simmer. Whilst we're doing that, I'm going to take our whisk and very gently, this is important actually, this bit, that you whisk the egg yolks and sugar together until they kind of go pale. And what you're doing, you're just really breaking the, the egg is, yolks the down. The colour's actually changing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's changing as I yeah, do it. Yeah. And the more I do it, it will go like really, really pale. And what you're doing is you're beating the sugar, almost dissolving it into mm. those egg yolks. See how it's going nice yeah. and pale? Yeah. Okay. Our lovely milk and vanilla mixture's coming to the boil. So in with our hot liquid. Yeah. Just moving it around, and then we're quickly moving it around. Now, what you're doing is that lovely hot temperature from the milk is now starting to cook that egg yolks and sugar. And now yeah. we return it to the pan. And we want all of that lovely vanilla flavour in there. One of my favourite ingredients, vanilla. Back onto the heat. And what we're going to do, we want to cook out the egg yolks. And we're going to take the egg yolks probably to about 75, 80 degrees. And what that happens is they then start to set, and then that's how the custard thickens. And also we cook out that lovely egg yolk mixture. Now here I've got gelatine. Mm -hmm. right. And what we're going to do, we're just going to add that in, pull it off the heat now, and just let it dissolve. Can you see how thick that custard's becoming? Yeah, yeah. And then once just that cools down... Just really, isn't it? Once that cools down... Mm. Our custard's going to really set and just become almost like a real, like what, what the French would call creme pâtissier, like a really thick yes, custard. Yes, I know that. What we do now, we just pass that. All oh, right, so any and lumps, now but we, we, the pods, the vanilla pods. Just the pods, and as you see, because yeah. we've kept an eye on it, because we kept moving it, there's yeah. no, nothing's coagulated, there's no. no lumps or anything. Now we just transfer that over here, and I've got one here that we've done, and as you can see, it's gone lovely and thick. Can I? All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, we're just going to bring that back. Mm -hmm. Here we've got some candied orange. Mm -hmm. We're going to add that all in, and that will just start to infuse into the custard as well. Like orange and custard, they are just so delicious together. Mm -hmm. We're going to fold that through. Looks like costume jewellery, does it? It's oh, uh, absolutely lovely. So we're just going to get those out of here. Now we're going to move over to spooning the cream in. Let me just get that cream in. You do a lot of spooning just, the cream in, don't you, really? We do. <laughs> we do. Just a bit. In fact, you can... Do you want to spoon it in for me, Matt? And I'm just yeah. going to stir it in gently. OK. You want like some that. more in? Yep. Go for it. And we're just doing it gently because we don't want to. We don't want the. We don't want to lose the body in the cream. What we've done there, Michael, we've whipped it to what we call like just past like a yogurt stage. Yep, yep. Like the thickness of yogurt. That's it. Keep going. Yeah, there's a lot of air in it. Yeah, it? Absolutely, and we want to keep that volume in there so it keeps so it stays nice and light. Because this is essentially what you call like a bavoir, which is a very sort of classic French so kind of. With more cream than actual loose. custard. Be like George the Fourth right. if you had all this, wouldn't you? So, Michael, if you could now go get me back our tian that we've done earlier. OK. That's it. Lovely in there. Yes, Thank chef. you very much. No fanfare this time. Is it nice and set? Yeah, it looks like you just Why do you call that it down a tian, there? by the way? Well, it's like basically I thought like tian was something different. It's like the, it's like oh, the it mould. mould yeah. So Absolutely. it could be anything. Yeah. So now we just get start to spoon that. Lovely mixture. Glutinous. Yeah, like, and don't, there's no, there's no, 
Nice way to do this. Get it in there. <laughs> Get it in there. Absolutely. But it's going blop. But, but you know what? As you'll oh, see, wow. when we turn this out and you've got your guests, they'll absolutely thank you for Keep it. Keep forgetting you're delicious. actually, at the end of the day, just going to turn it over like a proper marble. Yeah. Okay. So we've got that in there. There's lots of things to get your finger around. Now we're just going to brush some more kirsch over our sponge. Over the it's just yeah. absolute yeah, don't indulgence. Don't stint on the kirsch. No, no. Mm -hmm. there we go. And now if we just go underneath there like that, and then just don't break one foul swoop like that. Yeah. Pat it down a bit. And that's it. Pat it down. Bit more kirsch around the layers like that. It's gorgeous, isn't it? So, Michael, if I could just give that to you. Pop yeah. that in the fridge, I and that's going to set. Careful. And you should find one that I did earlier. You should. I might not come back. I'm going to have a little tidy up. OK. <laughs> ta -ra! Yes! <laughs> yes, look at that. that okay? Well, I say that, I hope it's not being held together by this. No, I was going to say, aren't you, aren't you a bit nervous, you know? I am Lift nervous. it up and it all goes... I am nervous. Ooh. Are you ready? Yep. I feel we should do it together. <laughs> you want to blame me, don't you, if it goes wrong? Right. Can I do it? Yeah, let's go. G gently, gently, gently. Ooh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> Look at that. Right, where's the knife? Now tell me, that is proper regal, isn't well, it? That, uh, that uh, is royal. Proper regal. I don't know. <laughs> Would you say that to the Queen? Moment of truth. Are you ready? Yep. Right, I'm going to cut a slice. You I'll grab get a the plate. plates. Okay. So we've taken a nice warm knife. So you need to take a lovely wedge. Oh, I love that sound. It, it, nice and solid, oh, isn't it's, it? It's, it's, yeah, but not overset. And you know what? For a really nice <laughs> setting time. In fact, in fact, do you know what? Do you know what? We're not going to muck about. We're going to stand it up. Look at that. Just a slight wobble. Just a slight, <laughs> and, that's, and that's exactly what you want. And you see, you can just see that cream's nice and light. I would recommend setting that overnight. One, the flavours develop, yeah. and two, everything just settles and it will just set beautifully. And you watch how light that is in the mouth. It's, I can't wait. Let's dig in. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. That's spectacular, isn't it? It's wonderful. And I promise you, it's not like rubber. It's soft and beautiful can and moorish. Eat the thing? Go! You get stop in there. talking and we can eat. <laughs> now, can I take it from this end? You do whatever you like. Go on. Go on, go on. I won't yeah. do it until you have a bit as well. Ready? Oh. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. That's good, no? We're off now. Yeah? We're off. I'm having that. That's, <laughs> that's the end of our celebration of coronations. See you next time. Right, what are you having? <laughs> this one here. <laughs> Royal food served on the grandest tables is so much more than just a meal. Historically, these extravagant dishes were created to represent power. They also set fashions. Nowadays, royal food is all about showcasing the best of British. In celebration of royal food... We know it's the Queen's recipe because we've got it in our own hand. ..from the present and the past. That is proper regal. We recreate old family favourites. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. What a yep. mess. We sample royal eating al fresco. Oh, wow. That yeah. is what you want. And revisit the most extravagant times. Pheasant, stag, turkey, salmon, oysters and turbot dressed in a lobster champagne sauce. Unbelievable! This is Royal Recipes. Hello, I'm Michael Burke and welcome to Royal Recipes. This is Audley End, one of Britain's finest stately homes. Built in the style of a royal palace and once owned by a king. In the splendour of the gardens, halls and kitchen of this grandest of country houses, we'll be recreating the food served at the highest royal tables. And it all starts here with this gem, a royal kitchen maid's cookbook, the only surviving recipe book of its kind in the royal archive. This is an exact copy of the original, which is kept at Windsor Castle. Inside, the recipes of Mildred Nichols, who worked at Buckingham Palace in the early 1900s. And for the first time in over a hundred years, 
will be bringing these recipes back to life. This time we're off to the races with the royal family. Today in the royal kitchens, chef Anna Ha prepares mutton pies a la Windsor from a 1930s royal Ascot lunch. Even if you don't have any winners on the race course, you've got a winner on the plate. <laughs> Historian Dr Annie Gray reveals how Edward VII liked to combine two of his great passions, racing and eating. There was a whole rash of dishes named for racing, a la jockey club, a la race winner. And former royal chef Darren McGrady gets cooking for the royals at Epsom. It looks gorgeous on the plate, perfect for the royal table and a day at the races. In the historic kitchen of this grand stately home, we return to the reign of the Queen's father, King George VI, and a dish from his first royal ascot. Hello, and here we are in the grand kitchen with top London chef Anna Ha. The royals seem always to have loved racing. In fact, King Charles II actually bought this wonderful house because it's close to Newmarket races, and he wanted the most impressive house close to the race course for entertaining. What do you think of racing? You're Irish, after all. I am Irish. I'm very fond of racing. Of course I am. Perhaps not as much as the royals, though. <laughs> That's not. So what are you cooking? I'm going to make mutton pie. But this that sounds is... a bit ordinary. No, this is no ordinary <laughs> mutton pie. This is mutton pie a la Windsor. <laughs> it's got a ring to it, hasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. And this one, I think, was actually served at Royal Ascot mm. in 1937, which is the first Royal Ascot that King George VI, the Queen's father, went to as king. Mm. So, it sounds posh. They're really posh. I mean, the royals, when they went to the races, and probably still do when they go to the races, they don't just have a snack, a no. of crisps and, you know, something like that. They, no. They have the works. And you'll see, as I make uh, this pie, that there is the works going on here. So, it sounds posh. OK, let's yep. get cracking. So, uh, here I have some onions slowly cooking in some butter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add the chopped up mutton. Now, this is a perfect dish for leftovers. So, in goes the, the chopped mutton. And I'm going to add to that um, my lamb stock. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to reduce this down. So, you need to cook it for quite a while, maybe about an hour or so, until it looks like this. Oh, gosh, that's really... That really does look rich. I know, you just want to eat that with a spoon right yeah, now. Absolutely. But you can't, Michael, you can't. <laughs> Don't so be this... too sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is our filling ready to go. Yep. And here I have blind baked four tartlet shells. Mm. So I've uh, placed a sheet of greaseproof paper on top of the pastry. And then inside that I've added raw rice. This just holds down the greaseproof paper to it's stop. Stopping it rising. Exactly. Yep. And you can reuse it. That's it's not sneaky, like it's isn't it? Yeah, it's quite clever. Yeah. So um, I'm going to fill these moulds now. Mm -hmm. This mix looks perfect. I think this dish is originally a Victorian dish, isn't it? Queen mm. Victoria's, um, one of Queen Victoria's royal chefs, Francatelli, yep. his name was. That's right, yeah. Came up with it. They're individual pies, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, one pie per person. They're well filled, aren't they? And deeply filled. That's it. OK, so once they're filled, you just want to seal them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a kind of lamb jelly. That's two sheets of gelatine in with about uh, 200 mils of your lamb stock. And once that's just dissolved in, which you can see... Oh, it just goes like that? Just like it? that. Yeah. When you say seal it, what do you mean by that? It means that this gelatine will set on top of that delicious succulent mixture. Mm -hmm. And it'll set on top of it and hold it in together because these pies are actually served cold. Cold? Like a pork pie. Ah, oh, right. Of course, they would have been prepared in Windsor, Windsor Castle and then taken to exactly. Ascot in hampers and so on. Perfect for the races, but also perfect for a picnic. And you know the royals loved a picnic. Absolutely. And now for our final stage, we have puff pastry to go on top of this one. This is a la Windsor. A la Windsor. <laughs> so uh, you need three cutters for this. I've already cut out four of the large ones. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to cut out four of the medium-sized cutter. And... Straight away after that, I'm going to cut out the centre of these because oh, right in the centre is where we're going to pour our little jellied jewels. Gosh, this is a lot of trouble, isn't it? I know. All for the royals, all for the royals. Now, so a little bit of egg wash. Mm -hmm. What's that for? This kind of holds all them together, but also it gives it a lovely shine. So it's dual purpose. Yep. Yeah. Now you put that one ah, right. on top. Yep. Yeah. 
on top, try this to get it as centered as possible. It? it is. And what's so lovely is that um, when it sits on top and we fill the center of this with the, the jellied jewel, that's what I think really makes it quite unique. Okay, just another little bit of egg wash. Yep. So you bake this in the oven, 160 degrees, 25 minutes or so until it's golden brown. Mm -hmm. And essentially they should look like these. Oh, wow. Aren't they pretty? <laughs> yes, they mm -hmm. certainly are. And they're going to get much prettier now in a minute. Mm. So you place them on top of your pie. Yep, put the lid on. And then in a pan, I have a little bit of uh, beef jelly. What is beef jelly? You cook down your uh, beef stock, your beef bones and your vegetables. And then just at the end, we add one or two leaves of gelatine mm -hmm. so that it would set up. So just pour that on top. Yep. It's so lovely. I have a lot of pleasure <laughs> you like in this. this bit, yes, don't you? I do. I really, you and your, really do. It's a mutton pie, you and your jewels. Oh, that's rather nifty. How do you keep the lid on? Well, that's what the lamb jelly does. It, once it sets cold, it holds everything together. You need to set these in the fridge probably for about an hour. And when you take them out of the fridge, they should look like this. I say. <laughs> Sweet, huh? With the shiny jewels on the top. That rattle is the cutlery. I think these are so special, and yeah. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, at the centre... I thought oh. it was going to shatter. I love that sound. Oh, yeah. No, nearly there. Look, oh. look at that, look at that. I didn't think it had set so beautifully, almost like a pork pie. And perfectly cooked puff pastry, lovely layers and I expected I nothing so less, myself. Anna. I expected nothing less. Right, uh, after you. OK. Gosh, there's a lot of meat in here, isn't there? Can I have... Mm. 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 Oh, oh yes, the consistency is great. I love the puff pastry on the top. It's so different, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's really good. Mm. Well, I mean, even if you don't have any winners on the race course, you've got a winner on the plate. <laughs> mm. Mini mutton pies. Just one of 11 courses served at King George VI first Ascot meeting. Racing is, of course, the sport of kings, and that tradition goes back centuries. One English town lies at the heart of it all. Newmarket in Suffolk is the home of British horse racing and the Jockey Club has long-standing links with the royal family. One of its most colourful and enthusiastic royal visitors was Edward VII, also known as Bertie. Food historian Dr Annie Gray discovers what went on when Bertie was in town. Edward VII was a man known for grand passions, women, food and horse racing. Once a year, he would hold an enormous Derby Day banquet to celebrate or bring together two of those loves, at least. And it was held for members of an exclusive racing club, the Jockey Club. I've come here to Newmarket, the spiritual home of racing, to find out more about how Edward VII combined his love of food with his love of the turf. The Jockey Club is where owners and breeders have been meeting for over 250 years and where the official governing body for horse racing in Britain was set up. Annie is meeting horse race historian Chris Garibaldi for a tour of the different rooms. Edward VII was a regular visitor and indulged in the pastime of coffee drinking in the club room, which dates back to the 1700s. So, Chris, tell me about this room. Well, this is the coffee room, and so, in a sense, this is the sort of centre of the club where it originally started on this site in the 1750s. The one thing you've got to remember is the Jockey Club is not a club for jockeys. The word jockey was associated with people who ran horses, the aristocratic owners. And, of course, the aristocratic owners actually rode themselves in, certainly, the 16th and 17th centuries. Quite a room, isn't it? It is, and what's lovely is you've got the survival of the booths, which gives a real impression of what it would have been like. It's sort of people coming to exchange gossip, to settle wages, really an assembly space before people moved up to the race course. You do get a real sense of place. I mean, all of these booths crammed with people, gambling in one corner. I just get the feeling it would have stunk of kind of horse and bad coffee and leather and just man. 
Edward VII employed his own coffee maker, an Egyptian called Emin Abrahim. And the best thing when you're reading about him in the archives is it specifies that he always wore an Eastern fez. <laughs> It was the absolute sort of pinnacle of social intercourse to be taking coffee in the, the, the late 17th century. Although the royal family hasn't stayed at the jockey club since the days of George V, they're certainly very present here. There are royal portraits, paintings and artefacts along every corridor. Presumably this grand room is the dining room. It is indeed, yeah. The main dining room of the club uh, has got some fantastic paintings showing derby winners. What about the connection between Edward VII and the jockey club? From about um, 1861, he trains his own racehorses in Newmarket. And with the Prince of Wales, a whole sort of new set come into Newmarket. And he stayed here, didn't he? He had a set of apartments he built did, and yes. a staircase built for him? Yes, there was a separate entrance. Um, the main entrance for club members is from Newmarket High Street, but the King's entrance was from the other side of the site, from the avenue, to allow him to come and go pretty well as, as, as he pleased. So he was able, really, here to live almost as a private individual? As normal as it was possible to, to, to be. It was around this time that Edward VII brought back the tradition of spectacular banquets thrown the day after the Derby, known as the Derby Dinners. The Derby Dinner gave him an excuse to entertain on this kind of palatial um, scale. His taste was for a very elaborate 18-course uh, <laughs> dinners. Incredibly rich sauces, everything supplemented with truffles and um, foie gras, and very much that sort of high-end, Escoffier-inspired French cuisine. And those things would have been reported in the newspapers, so Absolutely. I'm assuming that this is really something that is putting Bertie, Prince of Wales, on the map. Bertie's rejuvenated Derby Day dinners really did catch the spirit of the age. There was a whole rash of dishes named for racing a la jockey club, a la race winner. And you find in 19th century cookbooks, time and time again, illustrations of culinary kitsch, something unidentifiable, covered with lurid green colouring, with little jockey caps all the way round. And there was a real vogue for tiny little copper horseshoe moulds. What was in them might well be veal mousse or something in aspect. It didn't really matter. In your own aspirational way, you were embracing Bertie, the Prince of Wales, and his own lavish dinners, but there, on your own dining table. As well as the Derby dinners, Edward VII would enjoy some equally rich, indulgent and long lunches at Ascot. Edward VII wasn't only famous for his jockey club dinners, but for his absolutely prodigious lunches <laughs> at Ascot races, 14 courses for lunch. 14 courses. That lunch must have raced into dinner. <laughs> when did they actually get to see the races, one like, one? I can imagine they didn't have any time for the races. That was probably Edward's favourite day. <laughs> lunch running into dinner. Now, you're going to do a dish from Edward's luncheon party at Ascot That's Races right, in yep. 1908 yep. from the famous royal chef Gabrielle Chumi. That's what right. Is it? Well, so this is one of the 14 courses that mm -hmm. he would have served, and it's crab mousse with sauce remoulade. Love crab. Yeah. So I'm going to make the crab mousse first. Mm -hmm. And for the crab mousse, I need to dissolve some gelatine in some fish stock. So I'm just going to... You always dissolve your um, gelatine in a little bit of cold water. Now, that's leaf gelatine. That's right, leaf gelatine. And all you want to do is just dissolve that. You do not want to boil it. If you boil it, you, uh, you kill the gelatine. It stops working. Right. So it doesn't take much heat, and then it's already just it's gone. dissolved. It's disappeared That's already. It. It's disappeared. Yep. Now, you need that to be fully chilled down before you would actually use it in your mousse, mm -hmm. because you have things like whipped cream or mayonnaise that goes into this, and if you put hot liquid into them, it's game over. Yep. So the first thing that I'm going to add in is going to be the uh, mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. So um, in with the brown and white crab, I'm going to put a bit of paprika. Mm -hmm. And also now we're going to put in our chilled kind of fish stock, which has the gelatine. You can see it's starting to set there. Yes, it's quite it's thickening at this mm. stage, isn't it? Is this, a, is this a kind of modern dish or is it a dish very much of its time? Sort well, of thing you do or not? No, I mean, uh, yes and no. So there's lots of dishes that I would do now that were inspired by 
recipes like this. Mm. But perhaps now we mightn't have the mayonnaise in it. Um, I think we like a slightly lighter type of cuisine. And I think that the mayonnaise, although it has a lot of flavour, it's not really necessary anymore. So, so you've mixed it all together? I've mixed all that together. And then the last thing I'm going to do is actually fold through my cream. Oh. So I'm just going to add that in. Goodness. So this is a folding technique. So we, we don't want to over, sometimes you use the folding technique to keep air in something. But also when you're adding cream, you don't want to over whip a cream because then it gets very buttery. So we're just gonna fold this in. At this particular luncheon, there were 80 guests that must have been cooking all night. Incredible, like for, for 80 guests, 14 courses. And everything was cooked in the Royal Kitchens, put into hampers, taken to the race course. Now, what are you doing here? So I'm just going to fill these up to mm -hmm. about maybe two thirds full. And then I'm going to- Are they going to expand? No, no. I'm going to set them in the fridge then for mm -hmm. about an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And then I've left a little bit of space because I'm actually going to top up- Ah, right. You haven't finished them. Just a little bit of the, um, the gelatine and the fish stock, just to kind of seal the kind of freshness yeah. in and in on top of it. So I'm just going to smooth these down. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to need you to pop them into the fridge for me. They need to be refrigerated for an hour. Right, to but, set? To set, mm -hmm. but you, when you go there, you'll find that I've already got some in there oh, waiting for you. Oh, there's a relief. Thank you, <laughs> Chef. There you go, Anna. Thanks for that, Michael. Just pop it down there. Nothing Thanks. Nothing cold. Now I'm going to make a sauce remoulade. What's remoulade? So remoulade is essentially fancy mayonnaise. Isn't it a bit odd, mayonnaise with this? It's a bit old school. You know, when you look at some of the, the recipes from uh, uh, 50 to 100 years ago, mm. you will see an awful lot of mayonnaise in things, where I think now we do like food a little bit lighter. So we do use mayonnaise, but perhaps not as much. So you've got your mayonnaise here. Yeah. And I only need a small kind of about a teaspoon amount of Just mustard. to give it a bit of bite? Yeah, a bit of bite and lovely acidity as well that you mm. get out of um, Dijon mustard. Then I'm going to add the herbs, so your chives and your tarragon. Oh, I love tarragon. Perfectly chopped by myself. <laughs> Actually, then... you did do it incredibly finely. And, uh, it takes years, doesn't it? It does, it takes Tough. years. Dedication, hard work, mm. training. Lemon zest. And a bit of lemon zest on top. And it just brings it all to life. Yeah. Give it a nice stir. So it's not really complicated. It's not complicated. No, no, no. And you're just going to add a, a spoon of that into your dish. And you're going to serve it on the side. Or I'm going to serve it on the side. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So that's our sauce remoulade. Yeah. I'm now just going to put the last uh, stage uh, of the jelly on top of the crab. Right. Top it off. Top it off. So these are lovely and chilled. And I'll just pour this on, let's see. Yeah. So this is the fish stock with the gelatine that mm -hmm. we used earlier. It also went inside the, the crab mousse. And that's going to set pretty quickly, I would think. That will set that pretty quickly. Having freezing mousse underneath. Yeah. But it turns out that although this will set quickly, I've already made one finished. <laughs> How useful. Oh, it does look neat, doesn't it? So here we are. Yep. So we're just going to add our sauce remoulade here mm -hmm. and then our Melba toasts. Is this the time we taste? This is the time that we taste. I love crab. <laughs> there you go. OK, thank you. Right up. You first. OK. I think I'll go for a bit of the crab and the Melba toast I can first. hear the thundering of the racehorse hooves, but <laughs> I'm more interested in the crab. There we go. Mmm, I'm just smearing it. Mmm. But I'm not so sure about the mayonnaise. Let's try it with it. You're right, I want to try that Yeah, next. I think it's, you know, doubly rich. Mmm, mmm, a bit rich. I don't know, old school, but not old hat. <laughs> <laughs> Crab mousse was enjoyed by Edward VII at Ascot in 1908. Let's hope his horse came in as well. Nowadays, it's traditional for the Queen to serve tea at Ascot. The only lunches served in the royal enclosure are at Epsom for the Derby. One royal chef who's prepared many racing lunches is Darren McGrady. 
As a Buckingham Palace chef, Darren would also work at Windsor Castle, where all the royal lunches were prepared for Derby Day at Epsom. The Queen always serves a cold buffet, and in the 1980s, Darren recalls preparing some favourite fish dishes. I'm making a Glen Eagles pate, which is layers of smoked salmon, smoked trout, and smoked mackerel. It was one of the dishes I prepared for the royal family at Balmoral, Sandringham, Windsor, especially Balmoral Castle, where they had all of the fish, all of the salmon coming in from the River Dee. I'm going to start off with a loaf tin. We line the loaf tin with plastic wrap, and then I start taking the salmon, and we're actually going to line the outside of the mould with that salmon. So something like this dish uh, would be made using the salmon from Balmoral. Once the tin is lined, the next step is preparing the fresh trout, which will make up the first layer of the pate. So we're going to start off with the trout, and then in there, we're going to put some butter. See how easy this is. I'm also going to take some lemon and squeeze it straight in. Add some salt and pepper, and then a little fresh dill in there. Balmoral Gardens were incredible just to go and actually pick all your own herbs. They go into the blender. The Balmoral Gardens are absolutely amazing. They used to grow everything. It was almost self-sufficient for the eight weeks that the Queen was at Balmoral Castle. Look at that for a beautiful pate. Oh, oh my gosh, that smells so good. I'm gonna take this and put this into the bottom of my mold. So spend a little time just making that nice and flat so that when you cut into it, you'll see those beautiful layers. And the way to do that is to chill each layer as you go along. So this one will go in the fridge for a little while, ready for the next layer. As the trout pate cools in the fridge, Darren prepares the next layer by repeating the process, this time using mackerel. He removes the skin and then blends the fish with butter, lemon, salt and pepper. This one's had about an hour in the refrigerator and that's firmed up. And then we can take this gorgeous smoked mackerel and make that our next layer. And we, we always do it in that order because we want to keep a layer of pink, a layer of white, and a layer of pink. I've seen before at Buckingham Palace, one of the chefs actually make this dish, and he puts the salmon and the trout and then finishes with the mackerel. Pink, more pink, and white, it doesn't go. Start again. So try and make sure that that mackerel goes into the center. The mackerel is much denser fish, so we don't need to go back to the refrigerator with this one. We can go straight on to that next level of adding the smoked salmon. And this is a straightforward salmon. Again, some more butter in there, some black pepper, a little lemon juice, and finally, this time, we're just gonna put some chives in there as well. And then this next layer can go over the top. And this is our last layer. And we can take our salmon and roll that over the top. So fold that over, press it down slightly, and then with a plastic wrap that we have here. And that can now go in the refrigerator to set up the complete dish. Once the completed pate has set in the fridge, it's ready to be sliced and served. Once your patty's been in the refrigerator chilling for a few hours, it should look like this one here. Nice and firm, and it's going to be perfect for cutting. Now, if we were sending this to Epsom for the derby for the Queen's lunch, we'd leave it wrapped, we'd pack it in ice, and it would go to the races just like this. And once we got there, then we'd finish it with all the garnish, slicing it onto a beautiful bed of lettuce. But I'm going to finish this one uh, as if we're sending it right into the raw dining room. Trim off that first piece, and already it's looking gorgeous. Doesn't that look amazing? The smoked trout and the layers of smoked mackerel, it looks gorgeous. Glen Eagle's patty, beautiful layers, smoked salmon, smoked trout, smoked mackerel, looks absolutely stunning, looks gorgeous on the plate. Perfect for the royal table and a day at the races. A dish served in the royal box in the 1980s. The tradition of the cold buffet at Epsom remains, but the food served nowadays is much lighter.
I'm here in the library of the house with Ingrid Seward of Majesty magazine, royal commentator and biographer. So, how do the royals eat at the races these days? Well, it is a less grand affair these days because it's just tea. But when I say less grand, it's still served by a footman. It's still beautifully presented sandwiches, tiny with all the crust cut off. Cucumber? Cucumber, mm. certainly, and minced chicken and egg, and you will serve pims or champagne and iced coffee. I mean, almost anything you want. And tea is served after the fourth race at the back of the box. The box is quite large, the new box this is, the new royal box, and there's room to seat 50 people. And it's not a, a placement, but the Queen obviously chooses who she wants to sit next to. But this is only part of a, a wider entertainment over Ascot Week, for instance. Well, Ascot Week is a chance for the Queen to entertain all kinds of people, her, mostly her horsey friends, which, of course, she loves, and then foreign dignitaries and some of Prince Philip's foreign relations. Um, so they're all put in as a hodgepodge. But this happens at Windsor Castle? This happens at Windsor Castle. So what happens there? Well, it's very formal. People get I invited by letter, and then they're told exactly what to do, what to bring, what to wear. And in the old days, it was for four days. Nowadays, it's called dine and sleep, and they usually just stay one night. And ladies are, are asked if they would like to keep their hats on for lunch <laughs> or take their hats <laughs> off. <laughs> and um, lunch is quite a quick affair because then the royal party gets into their royal Daimlers and goes into Ho Windsor Park and then they change into the carriages and go on the procession, the famous royal procession down the course. Ascot races have also produced some famous romances. Princess Diana invited Sarah Ferguson to lunch at Ascot and she was sat next to Andrew and he fed her profito rolls and the rest is history. So in the very unlikely event that I was invited, uh, what would the experience be like? Well, in the very unlikely event that you were invited, you probably wouldn't be in the royal procession and you would, you would meet the royal party actually at the races in the royal box and um, you'd probably be introduced to the Queen, you'd be given a wonderfully strong drink and you'd have the best view of the racing you could possibly have and meet some very interesting people. Are all the royals equally enthusiastic about the races? No, they're not. Obviously, everybody knows that it's the Queen's big passion and it was the Queen Mother's and Sophie Wessex and Prince Edward. Uh, even Prince Charles likes racing, uh, but Prince Philip does not. And everybody knows that. So when he arrives at the races, he goes into uh, his own office at the back and he watches the cricket and does paperwork. <laughs> he's there on sufferance, is he? He's very much there because he knows it's his duty and he's always done it, um, but he's very much there under sufferance. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Every year, Royal Ascot attracts 300,000 racegoers. They get through a lot of champagne, a lot of lobster and a staggering 50,000 macarons. There's no other sweet quite as eye-catching as the highly fashionable macaron. Reshmi Bennett is a classically trained chef who specialises in these luxurious delicacies. My preferred method of making macarons is the French meringue method. You start off by making a French meringue, which is whipping up egg whites with granulated sugar in a mixer. Once it's whipped up to a meringue, you add ground almonds to it, icing sugar, and then you have to fold it all in together. Very controlled movements. The technique is what we call macaronage. And then you pipe it. So there are not that many steps. I've made it sound a lot easier than it is, but that is literally what it is. It seems likely that the macaron originated in Italy, where they've been produced by Venetian monasteries since the 8th century. But the first written recipe appeared in France in the 1600s, and it was French confectioners who popularised these sweet treats. The Italian meringue method came into France, I believe, when Catherine de' Medici of Italian aristocracy was betrothed to the ruling king of France, Henry, and her condition of marrying him was so that she could bring her Italian chefs with her to France. 
because they knew the art of the macaronage and how to make Italian meringue macarons. That was her condition. She, he accepted, gratefully, and she had these banquets and it was all very, very opulent. They'd have the tower structure of macarons giving an illusion of elegance. Rumour also has it that Catherine de' Medici was a bit partial to pistachio macarons because of how luxurious they were coming all the way from Iran, these pistachio nuts. So I would have thought pistachio macarons is fit for a queen. You give a tap. That's to get rid of any trapped air bubbles. And then we go into the oven. Macarons have become very popular in the UK since a French patissier set up in one of London's most exclusive stores in 2006. As a result, the treat that was once the preserve of the elite has become far more accessible. However, these macarons still enjoy royal patronage. We did have people that worked at the palace near our shop um, come over and purchase big amounts of macarons and whether it was for their own consumption, whether it was for the royal family, I don't know, one can only hope. But we did supply the Royal Foundation for one of their events as a charitable donation. There's much debate about the correct pronunciation of these dainty delicacies, often referred to as a macaroon, but strictly speaking, that's a coconut-covered meringue dipped in chocolate, quite different from the macarons being prepared here. One thing's certain, Baking them is a labour of love. A lot of people that have tried it, failed it a few times, they give up, and I would say don't give up. Maybe you didn't get it the first time round. Try it the second time, try it the third time. It's worth a try, and even if they don't look great, they'll still taste great. All good things come to those that try and try again. Anything that you get right the first time round, you don't really treat it with as much respect. And having mastered the art of macaronage, Reshmi has found new ways for pastry lovers to enjoy this ultimate indulgence. We started off doing just macarons, and then we expanded by just playing around with cake. And when we, we found that when we added all our macarons to the cake, people just went nuts for it. It's kind of like the ultimate indulgence. You've got a slice of cake, and you've got these really naughty yet luxurious macarons and they look so nice. We eat with our eyes first after all. It's like aesthetically macarons I do think are a superior confectionery. Macaron, macaroon, tomato, tomato, potato, <laughs> potato. <laughs> macaron sounds posh, macaroon sounds better somehow, more English. Well at those race meetings, Edward VII, loved entertaining guests, 80 or more at a time, uh, would often have served eaten mess as a dessert. And in the royal kitchens at that time was a kitchen maid called Mildred Nichols, and she kept the recipes in this book here, and she actually has got a recipe for eaten mess. But, Anna, you're going to do something with a bit of a twist. This is strawberries, the, yeah. the classic eaten mess. It, You're going to be something a little bit different. Yeah, I think everybody's used to um, strawberry eaten mess, which is delicious. Uh, but today we're going to do a, a tropical twist with a, a bit of papaya, some mango and some passion fruit. And it's super easy. It's as easy using um, strawberries, but maybe just a little bit more uh, special. Um, so the first thing we're going to start with will be the meringue, because that's what's going to take the longest. Um, and you just need to add, uh, I think it's like a half a teaspoon of salt to your egg whites and a tablespoon or a teaspoon maybe of vinegar. Salt and vinegar sounds a bit, a bit, you know, it's a pudding, isn't it? Yes, but they, uh, it actually strengthens the egg whites so that you can get these lovely, soft, kind of strong peaks. Right. So we're going to whisk it up um, till it's forming peaks before we add the sugar because it needs to have as much air as possible in it to give it that lovely, crispy meringue feel. So it's looking... Oh, that's coming up really well. Yeah, it's looking pretty good now. I'm going to start to slowly add my sugar soon. So I'm going to add this kind of fairly slowly at a time, not all in one go. Is it caster sugar? It is. It's caster sugar, yeah. So when you add sugar to eggs, you strengthen them. Mm -hmm. So it means that the air will stay in them for longer. Um, but if you add it in too soon, you will actually knock out the air of the eggs, which is kind of the opposite so of what you want to do. So you've got to get a balance. You've got to get a balance to it. But um, 
They're looking pretty good. I don't know if you can see that they're getting nice and glossy yeah, now. Can you see yeah. a change in them? They're lovely. I love um, the way it's called Eaton Mess. There's lots of stories about it, aren't there? There yeah. is, yeah. I think yeah. there's that funny story where the headmistress, um, the, the cake was placed, or the dessert was placed on her chair and then she sat on it. You could imagine the schoolgirls <laughs> loved that, yeah. Oh, there's another story about how the Eaton, uh, Eaton boys were carrying a pavlova, I think ah. it was, and dropped it and didn't oh. dare admit to whoever they were carrying it to. <laughs> didn't dare never admit that they'd done it. So they scraped it up off the floor and put it in a, <laughs> and, 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 you know, a, a famous dish was born. I didn't, I didn't know that. Now there's the last of but our I sugar going in. Ah, oh, beautiful, yeah. But I think it has been quite traditional, hasn't it, at the Eaton Harrow uh, cricket matches. You know, those two top oh, public yes. schools when they have an annual yeah. cricket match. I think Eaton Mess is traditional. Oh, I say, it's really stupid. Pretty much done. OK, now we're going to spoon this onto our tray. It's essentially a summer dish, isn't it? Obviously, when it's using summer fruit, but, but... Well, I think it can be any time of year, really. Well, Especially since we're doing tropical fruit. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I think you could have it in the summer if it's strawberries um, and raspberries. You could have a roasted apple one as well, which would be quite delicious. Maybe put a little bit of cinnamon in your cream, which would be quite nice. So we're going to do two kind of... Whopping meringues. Two large meringues, yeah, so then we can break them up afterwards. I'm just going to smooth it out to give it a nice kind of round shape. It's still a favourite of the royal family, isn't it? Yeah, so I hear, yeah. Yeah, but I think it's a favourite in everybody's household. Yeah, but I think particularly for them, they, because they, I think they grow quite a lot of soft fruit, strawberries, especially up at Balmoral, and when they go there for the late summer, I think that's yeah. the time when they have it. Well, we always had fruit bushes um, out my back garden when I was a kid, and I yeah. can remember stealing the berries before it was time to pick. <laughs> yeah, and getting in quite a lot of trouble about it. But... I bet, I bet. Did um, you so... have eaten mess? Uh, yes, of course, um, but we had them with blackberries. Um, so into the oven, uh, it's at 100 degrees for about an hour and 20 minutes or so until it's lovely and crispy. OK, Mum. <laughs> so now I'm going to chop my fruit to go inside the... Um, the mix. We, I already have some uh, papaya chopped and I'm going to go through some more, um, mango now. And, and then cut open the passion fruit. So there's a large stone inside your mango which you want to be careful to kind of cut around. You finished yet? I'm not. Do you want to give me Come a hand on. since I've got quite a bit to do? Why don't you cut open some uh, passion fruit for me? Okay. I yeah, wish let I'd... that be a lesson, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Hurry yeah. up, Anna. Huh? This could be dangerous. I just... It's not as dangerous as not helping me. Just straight down the centre. Yeah. How do I slice this? How do you... Oh, actually, how do you slice... A master class in fruit cutting. Come uh, uh, on. OK, OK. But... Straight down the centre. OK. Tricky. That was a bit tough, wasn't it? There. You can do that. Oh, my God, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Then scoop it out. It's so beautiful. Oh, like, you can yes. get, like, a lovely kind of floral, beautiful perfume mm, smell yeah. off it. It's not just about but the acidity. But how do you do a mango as well? I've always wanted to know how a proper professional dealt with a mango. Well, just watch and learn, Michael. Watch and learn. <laughs> what do you want me to do with these? Scrape uh, the, uh, scoop them the out with a spoon. I'll give you a spoon here. Okay. Just scoop them out and in with the okay. papaya there. I was about to say, where do I put it? But that was inviting a... <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> wicked Irish Oh, like Irish I'm response. so tough on oh, you. The Come on juice. now. You are tough, chef. No, oh, sensitive, Michael. OK, so you want roughly the same amount of kind of papaya and mango, really, to go through this. But okay. if you don't like tropical fruit, and we said you could nearly do this recipe with any fruit at all, because oh. what makes it so delicious is a bit of acidity. The, the sharpness. Love, yeah, the sharpness. The yeah. sweetness. Yeah, and then the lovely crunch off the meringue and then the creaminess of, of, uh, of your whipped cream, so it all kind of goes together nicely. I think I did that brilliantly. You did, like a professional. Shall I, <laughs> shall I do it again? Uh, yes, why not? Maybe stick the tip of it in the centre. All right. So there I'm going are. to just um, add my mango now with my papaya. Actually, that works much better, doesn't it? There we go. Now, in there, in we go. So I'm just going to start to break up the meringues. Yeah. You need them to be nice and crispy when they come out of the oven. I don't yeah. know if you can hear that. That's quite nice. Yeah. You were tapping it and it rattled. Yeah. So we're just going to break it now into the bowl. How big the pieces? Quite large, you know. You want to feel that texture of the, the crispiness of your meringue. Um, and then we're going to fold through with a, a couple of spoons of your cream. Just go behind you there. Looks like frog spawn, this stuff, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, actually. <laughs> but it smells. Uh, amazing, Absolutely isn't it? Divine, so yeah. floral. Yeah, really, 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 really nice. OK, so just gently fold your meringue through the yeah. cream. You don't want to break it up You don't anymore. want to really shatter it, no, do you? No, no. And then we're just going to put a spoon of each in... in uh, in whatever serving dish you're going to be using. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I can just feel the anticipation of wanting to eat this because <laughs> I can hear the kind of gentle crisp of the meringue being mixed with the cream. It feels lovely. It's the ultimate temptation. Yeah, it? and it reminds me of being a kid and this is the part that you're always allowed help with, nothing yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And scraping around the bowl and all that kind mm. of stuff. Now look at this now. Oh, the colour of this is so beautiful. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. And it doesn't take much effort, just a spoon of this now to go on top. The beautiful orange and yellows, the little and you're just putting it on the top? Just on the top. Now, of course, you could Is mix it through. Is that because you have time? I mean, would you mix it through? You could mix it through if you want, but I think that by putting it just on top, you get this glorious colour, and yeah. straight away you get a lovely perfume smell off it. And I suppose if the, if the, if the trick for the dish is to have the contrast between yeah. the textures and the tastes, then having them different would be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So here's your tropical eaten mess. Right. Yeah, and I'm just putting a little squeeze of oh. lime on top. That just gives it like an extra zing and yeah. brings it to life. Yeah. Again, there's that's a your first taste sensation. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we have it. So I think you might need a spoon. I think I might. Oh, come go on. Go on, go on. You get, you get stuck in first. <laughs> no, come on. Okay, first. okay, okay, okay. You don't have to tell me twice. No, no, quite. Oh, you can just hear the crunch mm. of the meringue, and that's what okay. I love so much. You can make a real mess with it. Mm. Oh, mess. Yeah. Oh. Oh. It's so delicious. Mmm. A difference in texture. Mmm. And you've got the sharpness, passion fruit and the lime, and the sweetness, and then that sticky, lovely stuff. Mmm. You could just imagine King Edward VII at Ascot, can't you? Mmm. Celebrating his winners with eaten mess and champagne. Oh, you're like a poet. Oh. How right you are. <laughs> Royal food served on the grandest tables is so much more than just a meal. Historically, these extravagant dishes were created to represent power. They also set fashions. Nowadays, royal food is all about showcasing the best of British. In celebration of royal food, we know it's the Queen's recipe because we've got it in our own hand. From the present and the past. That is proper regal. We recreate old family favorites. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. What a yeah. mess. We sample royal eating al fresco. Oh, wow. <laughs> that yeah. is what you want. And revisit the most extravagant times. Pheasant, stag, turkey, salmon, oysters, and turbot dressed in a lobster champagne sauce. Unbelievable. This is Royal Recipes. Hello, I'm Michael Burke and welcome to Royal Recipes. This is Audley End, one of Britain's finest stately homes, built in the style of a royal palace and once owned by a king. In the splendour of the gardens, halls and kitchen of this grandest of country houses, we'll be recreating the food served at the highest royal tables. And it all starts here with this gem, a royal kitchen maid's cookbook the only surviving recipe book of its kind in the Royal Archive. This is an exact copy of the original, which is kept at Windsor Castle. Inside, the recipes of Mildred Nichols, who worked at Buckingham Palace in the early 1900s. And for the first time in over 100 years, we'll be bringing these recipes back to life. This time, we're cooking royal food inspired by the Commonwealth. Today, in the Royal Recipes kitchen, Paul Ainsworth cooks up some tropical delights. And it's another one of those royal recipes that's just really extravagant. <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, it's bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Anna Ha tours the Royal Yacht Britannia, scene of so many Commonwealth and diplomatic banquets. Nelson Mandela and Winston Churchill were all entertained here. And Dara McGrady cooks up a recipe first served to the Queen in Australia. The Queen loved the recipe so much that she actually asked Government House if she could have the recipe. In the historic kitchen wing of this stately home, we begin with a dish from Malta, one of the Queen's favourite Commonwealth nations. Welcome to the great kitchens and the equally great Michelin starred chef Paul Ainsworth. We're cooking with the Commonwealth today. It's said that the Queen regards the Commonwealth as her greatest achievement. I mean, she's the first head of the Commonwealth, titular yeah. head of 52 countries. Incredible. So what are you going to do? Today, Michael, we're going to cook 
mushroom stuffed quail with a beautiful truffle butter sauce. Now, this is based on the dish that was actually the main course for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malta in 2015. Absolutely, yeah. So we've made a couple of little changes. Um, we're going to stuff our quails with what the French call a duck cell, which is this here. So we've got uh, chestnut mushrooms, parmesan, some cream, garlic, thyme, uh, some shallots, and some wonderful English truffle. <laughs> now, here is the quail. Uh, do you like quail? Lovely little fellas, aren't they? But they're very controversial in Malta. Right, they have okay. this banquet because they shoot the quail when they migrate north in April and May. Uh, and of course, the environmentalists are all up in the air about it. They had a referendum, and a, just a, a thin a referendum, and by a thin majority, they decided they'd go on shooting them. <laughs> <laughs> fancy that, so, eh? Yeah, fancy that. So Excellent. You're, that's where the stuffing goes. So, this goes. is where the stuffing goes. So, this quail has just been boned out. So, basically, we've taken the carcass out, but left the, left the legs on. So, the, the idea is, is now to wrap it back up so it resembles, it resembles the bird again in, in, as a whole. So, what we do is we just Put it over like that. So you need to kind of make sure that you've got plenty of stuffing in, but not so it's kind of bursting out. And you see how we're just closing it back up now. It's fiddly, isn't it? It is fiddly. But do you know what? Again, it's one of those great dinner party dishes that you could do this the day before, and it's really worth the effort once you see it served. So we're just basically putting these cocktail sticks. Mm -hmm. And that is just because when it when we turn it over, it's also going to be down this side. So it's going to just seal in when we cook it, okay? So we're going to turn it back over, and now you can see it starts to resemble the bird, the bird again. Yeah. Now this technique is called trussing. So again, I know it seems Try slightly fiddly. Yeah, it? if you could, you just take the top there like that. Hold it's like, it like a that. microscopic turkey, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, a microscopic <laughs> turkey, <laughs> that it is, yes. So, and we're just going to go like that, and then back under the bird. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, just back, so if you just hold it there like that, fiddly, and then just... Clever tie it round. It actually doesn't take that long. We're just going to cut the okay. cut the string there, like that. Yep. And there we have our two truss birds. It's actually not that bad. No, no, no. Okay? And I'm just going to hand those to you. They're not going to get away. No. <laughs> In the oven, 200 yeah. degrees for 20 minutes. Done. Okay? okay? Thank you, Michael. These ones look ready, Paul. Oh, look at those. <laughs> Fantastic. Look Beautiful. At them. Stand into attention. Tension, right? aren't they? <laughs> yeah, look at that. Beautiful. Right. You're going to let them rest? Yeah, that's it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, on to our sauce. So, what we're making here is kind of it's a truffle butter sauce. It's a bit like a beurre blanc, but a beurre blanc, strictly speaking, is no cream. So it's just butter and then white wine vinegar and white wine. This sauce, very simple, shallots finely diced to get the flavour out of them quick. White wine reduced right down, so the alcohol's burned off. A clove of garlic, some thyme. And what we're going to do, Michael, is we're just going to oh, add... Oh, you're going to put some cream in, are you? going to add some cream. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't be right, would it? No. <laughs> so we're just going to add some cream. That's your signature dish, cream, isn't it? <laughs> not, not mine, the French. Ah, right, right, right. OK, so we're just going to stir our, stir our cream. Yeah. Like so. Got that lovely flavour of the thyme. Just, and just with your spoon, hit the thyme, get the flavour out. Yeah. Same with the garlic. Squeeze out the oils in it, eh? Absolutely. Right. Next, the butter. Yes, so, of course, the butter. All of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, the sauce is just coming to the simmer there, Michael. We're just going to add in our butter. Yeah. And this is a really sort of classic kind of French sauce. Cream and butter. Cream and butter, <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to season now, not at the end, because I want to bring that flavour out as much as I can mm. from the from the thyme, the shallot, that lovely white wine. And just now, with a whisk, just stir it in. And what you're looking for is just a really lovely, velvety sauce. Mm. Where we've... Where we've um, finely diced the shallots, we can use those shallots in our sauce. Right. So we're not going to take them out. All we're going to remove is the thyme and the garlic. So a little bit more butter, Michael, until we get achieve that nice sort of velvety consistency. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been quite a nostalgic trip for the Queen, actually, because the Queen was in Malta uh, as a young married woman, you know, when uh, right. Prince Philip was a, a first lieutenant in the Navy in 1949 before she became queen. So she must have had, because quail's quite a dish there, she must have had quail then. And it must have kind of taken her back, I think. Right, there we have it. Yep. So we're just going to move our sauce onto the board there now. Have a little taste. 
Oh, yes, please. OK, so something here. Just have a taste of it now. Mm-hmm. Like so, oh. Michael. Yep. And it's pretty go. delicious. OK. Mm. No, I wouldn't say it was rich. It's not, is it? Yes, it is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and now we just add a little bit of lemon. It was pretty... And you've just got that, rich. yeah. You've, but you've got that uh, exactly. So you've got mm. that cream, that butter. Now we I'm just not complaining, man. No, no. <laughs> now we just add a little bit of lemon. You have a taste yeah, now of that do. difference yeah. with the lemon. Okay. Now here I've got some wonderful. Mm. Makes a big difference. It does, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Lovely. Look at those. <laughs> There's that need to attention to. Pom fondant. Pom fondant. Okay. Basically, butter, roasted potatoes, a little bit of chicken stock, some thyme, some garlic, and just keep cooking them and cooking them and cooking them, mm. and eventually you will end up with that. The ultimate roast potatoes. They are. <laughs> Next to that, we've got some delicious green beans. Mm -hmm. So we're just turning those over in some butter, and we're ready to plate up. Here we go. Right. Yes, please. I've been very so, patient. So have the quail, by the way. <laughs> they have, haven't they? Yeah. Right, so just a little pile of French beans like so. How do you get them to be so beautifully, gleamingly green it's all the just, time? It just comes to me naturally, Michael. Uh. I don't know how. So we're going to take one... See, we've removed the string and yeah. taken the cocktail yeah. sticks out, yeah. OK? And now that'll be nice and full, like that, OK? I'm going to take one of our gorgeous pom fondants, like just the one? so. Just the one. Mm. Next to it like that. Wow. OK? And now, this beautiful ingredient here. Mm. English truffle. Have a smell. OK? Mmm. They don't taste these are, much, do they? These they are from smell Wil so These ones, these are nice. from Wiltshire. Oh, really? So, um, yeah. And they use dogs as opposed to pigs, you know? That, the reason for that is because the pigs will eat them. <laughs> They've got ultra-sensitive noses, but yeah, they will yeah. eat them. Yeah. So, now, that lovely sauce just over our beans, like so. Love truffles. Like that. Such a powerful perfume, isn't it? Now, for me, we're just going to hit that dish again. All over. And there you have it. Mushroom stuffed quail, pom fondant, truffle butter sauce. My goodness. <laughs> you wouldn't want a first course or a third no. course with that, would you? <laughs> I mean, it may be a little bird, you but think. you've done it proud. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's have a taste. <laughs> yes. You've done it beautifully, actually, haven't you? It seems a shame to break, to into, break into such into a it. perfect... But I think I will. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> there you go. There Thank you, you very much. You first. Show me the way. Straight in. Because it's because there's no bone, which is lovely. Oh, you can just... You go just straight go straight in, in and look oh, straight into oh. that stuffing. And you, that's it. That meat's still so juicy. Bit of the sauce. Have a go. It's that fondant potato that I'm really oh. keen to have a go at. You'll love that quail, I know you will. Mm, that is yeah. absolute. Have a bit of the fun. That's it. Look at that. Oh. Soft, fluffy. Mm, mm, mm. There we are. Now, that's what I call a mouthful. Don't mm. look. Mm. That lovely earthiness mm. coming through from this mm. brain, isn't it? Oh, it really is nice. Mushroom, truffles, potatoes. And the quail is a lovely consistency. It's isn't it? beautiful, isn't it? Mm. And the potatoes. Mm. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any Happy potato. With I didn't have any potato. No. Um, Happy with that? Mmm. You know, I bet the Queen loved that. I bet she did. Roast quail, Commonwealth style. The Queen has been hosting such dinners for over 60 years, and many were held on board the Royal Yacht Britannia. <laughs> Chef Anna Ha has come to Edinburgh where the Britannia is moored. Launched in 1953, the Royal Yacht was designed to travel the globe and it became an iconic symbol of the Commonwealth. But it was also a family home, everything designed exactly to the Queen and Prince Philip's liking. Ah, so this is the Sun Lounge. And it was the Queen's favourite place to have her breakfast and afternoon tea. Apparently it was her favourite place on the yacht. And I can see why. It's gorgeous. The Britannia acted as an ambassador for the country for over 44 years, travelling a million nautical miles on over 900 state visits. This is a floating palace. And there's no gold, there's no pearls, and there's no sapphires everywhere. It just feels really cosy. The yacht was finally decommissioned in 1997 and has been moored in Edinburgh ever since. 
Noel Coward, Nelson Mandela and Winston Churchill were all entertained here. But I bet none of them got to cook in the kitchen. Now Anna is going behind the scenes to the royal galley. It's much bigger than I expected. To whip up a dish that was served on board on a 1995 trip to South Africa. Roasted duck and peach salad. The first thing you've got to do is marinate your duck breast. So what I'm going to add to this is some crushed juniper berries. So they're pretty easy to crush, like you can crush them with the back of your knife. OK, so we'll take a bowl, <coughs> scrape them into it. And all it needs is just like a little sprinkle of ground cinnamon. I'm going to season the duck with a bit of salt. And I'm also going to add olive oil. I'm just going to give that a little mix. OK, so next we're going to slice the Brussels sprouts. Now, I'm going to slice them really thin today, but you can grate them or you could just roughly chop them if you wanted. So, you know, it wasn't just chefs that cooked here in the royal galley. There's a story that I heard that the Queen Mother used to like to stay up late sometimes with the crew and the next morning they would leave her an apron and ingredients and she'd rustle them up some breakfast. I mean, that's incredible. I think I've got enough sprouts now. So the next thing I'm going to prepare is the vinaigrette. So I'm going to start off with a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. Then I'm going to go with white wine vinegar. Then I'm going to go with extra virgin olive oil. Pinch of salt, very important. And then I need to add my marmalade. The flavour that marmalade gives, which is kind of tangy and interesting and a little bit kind of warming, which goes so well with the duck. And all you need to do is essentially just stir it in really well. OK, I think that looks nice and mixed, so I'm going to throw my sprouts in. You can see how that's all just come together. You've got little flecks of your secret recipe just hiding through the Brussels sprouts there. OK, now it's time to get the duck breast cooked. Anna fries the duck to crisp up the skin before finishing it in the oven. So these are pretty much ready to come off. So while the duck is cooking in the oven, I'm going to get the peach ready now. It's always good to try your peach, see how sweet it is. Hmm. And then we're just going to caramelise it on quite a high heat. And don't be afraid to add maybe a little bit more oil. So you want this nice golden caramelised colour on top of your peach. So I think we can take these off. I'm just going to add them straight into the salad. And I'm going to add the pearl barley. Two generous tablespoons of portion would be good. Give that all a nice stir. So it's time to get the duck out of the oven. So you want to slice your duck, you know, nice and thin. You can make this salad so elegant. A couple of heaped spoons of your kind of cabbage salad. You can see the lovely flecks of your marmalade just kind of through that, the orange zest. And then we're just going to layer it up with your beautiful pink duck. One more peach would be nice. And there you go, you have your roasted duck and peach salad. Looks good. We're talking about royal food in the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth's quite close to your family story, isn't it? Very close, very close, yeah. My heritage is that my mum is from the Seychelles. Oh, those yeah. paradise islands in the oh, Indian Ocean. Absolutely, no place like it. Beautiful place. Uh, not even Padstow, where you uh, work and oh, live? Oh, now I'm torn. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there. <laughs> Golden Beach, yeah, I know, OK, we won't go there. Famous for Creole cooking in, uh, in the Seychelles. And you're going to do us something? Lots of fish, lots of seafood. Yeah. And something they have out there, which is, we and we do here as well is octopus mm, mm. and lots of um, octopus dishes but in particular beautiful salads and basically my mum's recipe my mum's dish so um, it's kind of like a salsa so we've got this wonderful octopus here now the, the variety like this is the octopus vulgaris which is basically a common octopus mm -hmm. and the reason is they call it like a double sucker so it's lots more flavor cooks nice and just, yeah, just lovely tweet, nice and tender once it's cooked. But essentially it's the same as the octopus you get round our shores? Yeah, no, no, not, not quite the same. Um, like I say, it's, this is the double sucker variety. Right. So what we've done is previously we've cooked it for um, two to three hours, yeah. basically until it's nice and tender, so you can just put a knife through it. Let it cool in that stock of vegetables, white wine, fish stock, 
And then once it's cool, take it out and let it set like this. And what we're going to do, Michael, is we're going to take, we're going to have some nice little tentacles because they're nice through the salad. Yeah. Next to me, I've got a char grill that's just warming up and getting nice and hot. And then we're going to take some nice midsections like that. And you can see just how tender, and but it's still so juicy. Very tender. Yeah, really tender. Do you like octopus, Michael? I do, I do. I spend yeah. a lot of time in Greece and Turkey and you can oh, see I'm them absolutely. bashing them, yeah. bashing the octopus to make it tender, presumably. Yeah. So in here, we're just going to take some large pieces, some small pieces and some tentacles, just like so. Bit of a little bit more in there. The Seychelles, like where um, uh, William and Kate had their honeymoon. Yes, they did, yeah. I wonder yeah. if they had octopus. I, I bet you they did. Yeah. They would, so, yeah, it, they absolutely love their, their seafood out there. So here we've got a nice hot char grill. Mm -hmm. We're just going to very lightly, we don't want a lot on there because we don't want it to smoke, we just want to basically coat it. With olive oil? With olive oil, OK? And we're just going to, not pepper, just some salt. So I could just get pushing here. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And we're just going to move that round, mm -hmm. like so. So just our seasoning. A little bit more, a little bit more oil and get it straight on cooking. And what, the reason we don't put lots of oil on there, Michael, is because we just want it to gently seep down onto the onto the char grill and what's happening is as, as it comes down it's going back up because it's so hot and giving it just a really light smoky flavour. You'll see I've put the thick pieces on first, I'm yep. going to let them cook because I'm going to put these little thin tentacles to on crisp, later on up. just to crisp up. But look at that, yeah. oh man, the smell. <laughs> right, onto the salsa. Mm -hmm. So over here we've got some beautiful a lot of onions in Seychelles cookery. Mm -hmm. So we've just, all we've done with these, thinly sliced and pickled them in just a little bit of sugar, olive oil, white wine vinegar. So they go in there like so. Does that make them softer in taste softer as well as texture? Softer and acidity. Yep. Lovely acidity. We're going to take a, ch a chilli. Do you like it hot? I do actually, yeah. Good. So we'll leave a few of those, we'll leave a few of those seeds in, okay, and just really thinly slice the chilli because we want it in every mouthful. We just want these thin slices of chilli. And if you want You've it... You've done that a bit really of heat, fine, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, if you want a bit of heat in there, leave some of those seeds. OK, mm -hmm. next we move on to our tomatoes. Look at those, the colour of those. Right, right now, lovely and juicy, soft, fruity. Some yellow peppers. Yeah. Now, I love the yellow variety. They always pack a real lovely flavour. So the colours in here are wonderful. Now we're going to take some spring onions. We're just going to take that little tail like that. And just so they're not... So they're really prominent in the salad. Just slice them on the diagonal like that. Oh, that's a good idea. OK. Which Do you know what I mean? Rather than they're just little ra round circles. Yeah. Was your mum a good cook? Amazing cook. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. I grew, up in a, I grew up in a guest house and I was lucky that my dad would cook as well. And uh, Monday to Thursday, it'd be quite traditional fare. And then on the weekends, mum would take over for the guests and we'd have lots of kind of Creole-influenced dishes, lovely curries and stuff. Yeah, mum was an absolutely fabulous cook. Right, just going over to our octopus now, Michael. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to turn it over like that. Look at that. That's what you want, that lovely char-grilled flavour. Have you got a cook's asbestos hand? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> am, um, actually. <laughs> OK, now I've turned those over like that. Yep. OK, now we're going to put our tentacles just next to it in the corner. The smell is gorgeous. And what's lovely as well, you've got these lovely, light, fresh, beautiful, sort of acidity kind of happening with these flavours and you've got this lovely charred octopus. Mm -hmm. Right, so we've got spring onions in there, peppers, onions, our lovely cherry tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to get some zest. So we're just going to okay. lightly zest a lemon. It's exciting, isn't it? OK. And, and it's a quick dish, isn't it? Yeah, it really is a quick dish. OK. Now I'm going to chop some coriander in there. Again, Mm. Oh, that's a really fresh taste. Seychelles while cooking yeah. is... Uh, I think a lot of people think that it's quite spice-orientated, but there's a lot of fresh green herbs. They love basil, chives, coriander, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. OK, some more oil. In there, like so. And we're just going to give that a little mix. Look at that. Absolutely delicious. And the colour is terrific. It's, it's gorgeous, isn't it? OK, we're going to have a little bit of lemon juice and lime juice. And the reason, I've just rolled that fruit before I sliced it, so it really releases the juices out. Well, you just roll it yeah, like that that's on the it. thing? Yeah. Absolutely. OK, now we're going to go in with our octopus into the salad. And the reason I do that as well, so you add a little bit of warmth going through there, which just gets all those lovely salsa flavours we've got in there coming alive, like so. 
a little bit more olive oil. You're pretty liberal with the olive oil. Yeah, it's delicious. Nice and peppery, absolutely gorgeous. And now we just plate up, Michael. So we just stir uh, like so, OK? Get our plate. I can't wait for this one. And just like that, in the middle, all those beautiful flavours, crunchy. This, this, this dish literally has everything. What is it about you chefs that you manage to put things on the plate, even though it's a kind of mess of stuff, you manage to make it look as though it's planned? Well, do you know what? Because Yeah, be, but it's not planned and you're not playing around with it, and that's the whole point to it. Mm. And some lovely fresh rocket, just for a little bit of pepperiness as well. And that rocket's rocket, lovely, so isn't it? It's my favourite salad. Absolutely, as well. And because this is what this is, it's a beautiful salad. We'll have a little bit more, a little bit more of our zest mm -hmm. over the top, and our lime. This is going to be taste juice. really fresh, juice really like clean. Taste. Okay, little, just a touch more olive oil, and there we are. <clears throat> have a taste. Ready? Yep. Here we go. I mean, that octopus just—it is beautiful. And Beautifully tender, but slightly it's the hard on the outside. of everything and the crunchy vegetables and the sweet, salty, savoury. It's. Mmm. Mm. All we need. A crisp glass of white wine. And a white beach. And a sunset, somewhere over Africa. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> Absolutely delicious. Mm. A feast for the eyes and for the palate. Commonwealth ingredients at their tastiest. When a dish goes down well with the royal family, they'll often ask for the recipe. And at a Commonwealth meeting in Australia, the Queen was taken with one particular chocolate pudding. And it soon became part of the repertoire of royal chef Darren McGrady. Darren McGrady worked in the kitchens at Buckingham Palace for 11 years. He regularly travelled overseas with the royal household, cooking on board the Royal Yacht Britannia. Some royal recipes were even collected on these tours. One time, Her Majesty was at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Melbourne, Australia, and they served a chocolate marquee. So the Queen loved the recipe so much that she actually asked Government House, where she was staying, if she could have the recipe. The chocolate marquise is a rich chocolate dessert for serious chocoholics. So we start off with some chocolate, which we're going to melt in a bowl. And then in the mixing bowl, we're going to add some softened butter, some sugar and some cocoa powder, and then put it on the machine and just beat that until it starts to soften. Once that's all mixed in together, we're going to add our melted chocolate to it. Can't tell you how many times I've cooked with chocolate in the royal kitchens. Most of the dishes were chocolate. Everyone loved chocolate. So once it's melted, it goes into that bowl, and that's all mixed together. It smells so good already. Once we've got all that mixed together, we'll just set that bowl aside. And then I've got three eggs here. And I only want the yolks and add them into some sugar. I'm going to mix all those together. And once they're mixed in, a little bit of whiskey in there too. If you're making this for the children and you don't want to use the whiskey in there, obviously, then you can put orange juice in and you'll make a, a beautiful chocolate orange marquee. And then it goes into our chocolate mix. Whisk all that into the chocolate. And then I've got some whipped cream here that I just put into my chocolate. And lightly fold that into the chocolate mix. So there's no lumps, it's all combined. And once all that's combined, we have gorgeous chocolate marquee that I've taken a mold that I can line with plastic and then just pour this chocolate mix into here. Smooth that out, and then all we need to do is put that into the freezer overnight to let that set up. 
After it is set in the freezer, the next step is presentation. Back in the 1980s in the royal household, it was served with a number of different garnishes. And this one's set up nicely. It's been in the freezer overnight. Now we can slice it. And the secret to slicing the chocolate marquee is to always use a clean knife and a wet knife. So we get the tap running, and then we slice into it. If you don't use a wet knife and you don't clean the knife afterwards, you end up with crumbs all the way across the top. And we can't serve that to the queen, can we? Look how beautiful and perfect and smooth and creamy that looks. Clean the knife, wash off that chocolate, and then back for the next slice. The queen had this dish at Government House in Melbourne with a coffee creme anglaise. But at Balmoral Castle, we'd actually serve it with a salted caramel sauce. And if the Queen and Princess Margaret had been out picking berries, which they often did at Balmoral, then we'd use those to garnish the plate. It looked amazing. There it is, a chocolate marquee. Salted caramel sauce and berries. Doesn't get any better than that. Alongside her chocolate pudding, the Queen might enjoy a slice of one of her favorite fruits, pineapple historically grown in the royal gardens and still growing the Victorian way in Cornwall. These are Cornish pineapples growing at the Lost Gardens of Heligan in the only working manure-heated pineapple pit in Britain. It took three years to grow the first fruit and the team here were so excited they decided to mark the achievement by sending one to the Queen, as Heligan's archivist Candy Smith explains. It was the Queen's golden wedding anniversary, and so knowing that the pineapple was her favourite fruit, we decided that we would deliver her one of the first crops. It had taken a huge amount of work. Restoring the pineapple pit, which looked like this before work began, was just one small part of the massive restoration project which has been going on at Heligan for 25 years. The uh, gardens were really um, created by four generations of the Tremaine family and occupied Heligan from the early 1600s right through until 1920. Two world wars had seen the house used as a military hospital and base, then rented out and the gardens fell into disrepair. We came upon them in 1990 when they were totally overgrown. What were the gardens to the house had not been tended for around 30 years or so. The transformation of the gardens is staggering, but learning how to grow the exotic fruits the Victorian way proved almost as challenging, as gardener Nicola Bradley explains. If you've got the heating and, and the humidity, then that's fine. You can grow a pineapple at home, no problem. The problem comes when you're growing them um, in this way, with this structure, without the use of modern technology. The team had no written instructions. They just used trial and error and shoveled a lot of manure. So the actual part that I'm standing in now is one of the side trenches, and there's one on either side. And this we stack with really fresh, hot manure, um, and that will give off uh, a heat as it decomposes. And we have this honeycomb venting in the wall, which the heat travels through, and then travels down through this um, sort of uh, gap in the wall here. And as the heat uh, rises, it comes out of the other side, the honeycomb venting into the growing chamber and just provides a nice, gentle, steady heat throughout the winter months. It probably takes about four people a whole day to barrow the manure in, and it's, it's a very physical job, um, but um, strangely satisfying, <laughs> really satisfying. This is how pineapples would have been grown in royal gardens dating back hundreds of years. Pineapples started to be grown early on in the 1700s. I'd say they were probably at the height of their fashion in the late 1700s going through to the 1800s. And were huge status symbols. It would have been really quite important for them to produce very high quality pineapples. And after adopting those same labor intensive practices, the team at Heligan got their reward. No one was more delighted than their royal neighbor. And we were lucky enough to have a, a private visit by Prince Charles in June 97 and showed Prince Charles these buds on the pineapples. 
It was wonderful to watch this exotic fruit in the making. And then by October, we had, I think it was five or six fruits. We decided that the first one had to be tasted by staff in case it should taste of horse manure. And it was indeed delicious. It was like nothing you've ever tasted before. The second fruit was then packaged up for Her Majesty. And the third fruit was sent to Prince Charles. Despite their success, the team won't be supplying supermarkets anytime soon. In an average year or a good year, we probably produce um, a couple of dozen fruiting pineapples. If you add up the manpower, you're probably looking at about £1,000 for a pineapple, which does make them very expensive fruit. The 19th century gardeners would never have got to taste this prized produce, but times have changed at Heligan. It's like all good things, isn't it? It take ages to produce and then, yeah, devoured in minutes, but, um, but enjoyed by everyone. Yeah, when it tastes this good, it's really, really worth all the hard work. You've cooked with pineapples a lot, haven't you, yes. uh, Paul? I mean, your restaurant's in Cornwall, and Cornwall's almost tropical, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so this is a pineapple dish, uh, as I understand it, and uh, one, an invention of one of the most famous royal chefs, Monsieur Carême, Carême. who yes. was George IV's chef at the beginning of the 19th century. What are you going to do? What's it called? This dish is called pudding d'ananas à la royale. Ah, oh, d'anana is, is French. It should be banana, but yes. it's French for pineapple. Absolutely, it? and okay. it's another one of those royal recipes that's just really extravagant. <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, it's bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going to take some sugar over yeah. some egg yolks, just like that, and we're going to whisk those together yeah. because the first part of this dish we're going to make is essentially a custard, yeah. but a custard like I've never made before. <laughs> so I'm just going to whisk these egg yolks and sugar together yeah. until they start to go nice and pale. So basically, we've blended the sugar right into the egg yolks. Just to my left, Michael, yeah. we have got the pineapple skins just in infusing into some cream, OK? Right. Well, aren't they rather bitter? They are. Um, but there's, this dish is so sweet that actually it's quite clever because it lends a little bit of sort of bitterness to it. So you can just see our egg yolks and sugar changing colour. Because pineapples were so expensive and exotic, weren't they, in olden times, that yes. they were, must have wanted to make the most of them, the, the wonderful taste of them. And I think it was because they were so difficult to grow. Yeah, and, yeah. even and in do, Cornwall. Yeah, even in Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we've just emulsified the sugar and the egg yolks yep. together. Over here, we're just going to pass this mixture, which is basically the infused cream. And I've never, ever done this before, <laughs> so this is a new one to me. OK. So now, back over there like that, and we pour this mixture... Oh, back into the pan? Back into the pan. Getting everything in, like so. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're starting to... We've just got this really sort of infused pineapple custard. There's a waft of pineapple in the air, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. So, from that, uh, from this. Like I said, and it's always fascinating for me seeing these old historic recipes and these old-fashioned techniques and what they did, which is great. So we're just going to turn the heat up a bit as well. So, like, like so. This is the sort of dish that made Monsieur Carême, George IV's chef, world famous, I think. Yeah, and it's, and it's really kind of interesting um, because also, as well, pineapple juice is very acidic. Yeah. Really acidic and doesn't often fare well in stuff like egg yolk, sugar, sort of custards like this, but, you know, it works. So how did Monsieur Carême solve that problem? Well, I think there would have been a lot of research, a lot of kind of trying these recipes out, and I think it was about as much about sort of things maybe not necessarily working, but making sure there was always that extravagance. And that look, looking good as looking well. Looking good, yeah. These, these moulds, you use plastic now, don't you? Yes. But in those days, moulds were terribly popular, terribly fashionable. Actually, I think it was rich people who had those, wouldn't it? The copper ones. Yes, I yeah, think yeah. Poor people had tin, tin. moulds, didn't they? So what okay, we're doing what here doing now? is now we're adding some pineapple syrup. So we're just putting that in bit by bit. So you've basically got this really lovely infused kind of pineapple custard. You're getting that pineapple flavour in every way, aren't you? Every way, from the skins, everything. Mm. Now we're just going to gently pour this into our mould, like so. Nice and gently and fill it up. Now, this is kind of like the base, the base for an ice cream. 
but back then they wouldn't have been churning. So it is literally just going all in, just to the top like so. And the best thing to do here is it is eventually those air bubbles will pop, but yep. we're going to let that settle. And what we'll do, we'll just take off the top and just, you see underneath we've got that custard? Yeah. And then we'll just take that off. So we'll just let that settle first, okay? So that is the first half done, ready to go. Right, next, we're going to go on to it's the bottom half. It's complicated, this <laughs> it is. isn't it? You're earning your money. Tomorrow. I am. So we've just got some whipped cream, mm -hmm. OK? Some pineapple that we've cooked in syrup, some pistachios, love pistachios, mm -hmm. and we've got some beautiful diced pear. So we're just going to literally put those ingredients into this cream. Oh, this is an assembly. So, and now in with our pineapple. And it's... <laughs> You know, I would, I just would never think of putting these two things together like this. It's, it's, so it's fascinating for me to kind of would you, just well, do would these you, old yeah, recipes. Would you, would you combine pear and pineapple normally? Um, I don't see why not. You no, know? but it's not like, something you actually it's, do. It's, no, it's not. And, and just the way that this dish, like I say, it's these two halves yeah, of, yeah. of utter madness. <laughs> <laughs> right, I've just combined that like so. So in there we've got our whipped cream, our pistachios, our pineapple and our pear. Right. OK. I suppose the, uh, the, the, the pear is a kind of softer taste and the pineapple's a sharper taste, so maybe they go well together. We'll find out. We'll find out. So, just in there, like so. Very rich again. It's very <laughs> it's typical. Does, another yeah. rich royal recipe. Yeah. OK. So, that's in there, like so. Now, just like this, Michael, yeah. right to the edge. Keep that mould in place because you don't want to move it. You want to keep it really firm in place so you can get that fruit right the way to the edge and eventually everything will just find its own way in because you want the fruit to lock just to all get in there so there's no gaps okay so all the way around like so so you spend a bit of time padding it down yeah and just eventually it will start to get nice and smooth like so but it, um, it's not going to set is it that's the next part oh sorry I'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> Right, so you've got that nice and smooth kind of surface, like so. Now that's going to go into the freezer for several hours, but before it does, I'm just going to let both of them settle. <laughs> While we wait, can I show you this? Yes. Looks like an ordinary pineapple, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a decoration. In olden days, right up to today, at banquets, of course they were exotic and everything in the olden days, but they're still a lovely decoration now. At royal banquets, you'd have as many as 80 of these pineapples as decoration on the table for the first three courses. And then, when the time comes for the fruit course, for the fourth course, maybe yeah. the fifth course, yeah. look. Look at what do you think of that? Look at that. <laughs> it's in there. It is. You don't even have to bring it Let's to the table. Look at it. There we are. Would you like a slice? Uh, yeah, please. There we are. Lovely. Mmm. Mmm. Lovely. Presumably it's tipped out with a bit of fanfare and mm. uh, a bit of business and all that kind of stuff. It's such an acidic fruit, though. Um, yeah. Right, a little palate cleanser. Yeah, absolutely. For your next course. But it's just a lovely idea, mm. isn't it? Right, where are we with these? Come over here. Oh, right. Oh, my goodness. Have a look under there. You might find something. OK. All oh, right. OK. I'm going to have to... God, it's heavy, these things, aren't they? <laughs> look at that. Oh. Look at that. Nice. <laughs> oh. oh. A proper royal pudding. It is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Isn't it? This is unbridled extravagance on a plate, isn't Absolutely. it? Fancy a slice? Mm, maybe. <laughs> Anticipation. <laughs> don't, don't knock it over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pressure, the pressure of this. I know, I know, I know. And don't hang about, come on. Right, in we go. Grab our plate. Yep. Oh, <laughs> I say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, it looks good. How regal is that? It, proper regal, proper I'd regal. say. Proper <laughs> regal. <laughs> go on, me, me, you, go me on. first. Oh, look at that. You get two puddings in one. Important to let it come up to temperature as well. Yeah. So, you know, a good sort of 10, 15 minutes out the freezer. Mmm. Oh. Totally that... different textures, aren't they? Mm. The top is fantastic. I didn't expect the top to be like that. 
Really? Why? No, uh, I really think because of the amount of pineapple juice and syrup that's in that mm. custard. It really works. Doesn't it's it? got like a condensed milk texture. It has. You're right. A lovely pineapple flavour. And there's a wonderful contrast with the bottom, which, if anything, is a, a little bland, but it's got those little explosions of, the of pineapple in it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, essentially it is mm. just frozen whipped cream. Mm -hmm. Look, perfect, perfect M to something like a Commonwealth bank prep. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Perfect M to this programme. See you next time. <laughs>